This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine... Invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting story about his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And now for our weekly visit with the good Dr. Watson. May I come in, Doctor? No, 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 Mr. Bartell. You know me better than that. Of course you can come in. I'm expecting you. I always look forward to these Monday evenings together, you know. (laughs) Me too, Doctor. In fact, I always say this is the one doctor's appointment that never scares me. Oh, that's very nice of you, my boy. Draw up your chair and... Make yourself comfortable. Thanks. And uh, what prescription do you have in mind for us tonight, Doctor? Well, now, let me see. Take one measure of subterranean peril, one of aristocratic lady in distress, a sprinkling of assorted villains, a corpse or two, and a little more than a dash of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Shake the mixture well, and you have the case of the out-of-date murder. Well, how did the adventure begin, Doctor? Exactly enough. It was in September of 1900. I remember that Holmes and I went to Eastbourne for a much-needed rest. The first couple of days we spent in soothing idleness. On the morning of the third day, Holmes, a dash of colour back in his cheek and a hint of the old sparkle in his eye, suggested that he should go and call on his good friend Evan Whitnell, curator of a nearby museum. And so, just after lunch on that September day found the two of us talking to Professor Evan Whitnell in his private office at the museum. It only seems yesterday. Holmes was there. Professor Whitnell, your recent discoveries in this part of England have made you world famous instead of just nationally famous. My congratulations. Uh, Professor, I do wish you'd tell me uh, about your discoveries. Well, with pleasure, Dr. Watson. Uh, uh, Less than two months ago, I was excavating on the downlands in this neighborhood when I was fortunate enough to discover a number of underground caves, a cave saturated with a heavy deposit of lime uh, that gave clear evidence of having the property of rapidly mummifying any flesh, human or animal, uh, deposited in them. Oh, gracious me, that's interesting. And what treasures have you unearthed, Professor? Well, a number of mummified specimens of animals clearly belonging to bygone eras. My prize specimen is the body of a large wolfhound. Uh, the inscription on its collar identified the animal as be, having belonged to some local squire in the year 1748. Amazing. I didn't know that limestone had such qualities of preservation. Uh, come in, come in. Uh, yes, Alan, what is it? Lady Clavering, Professor. She asked me to tell you that she was in the museum. Oh, yes, 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 sir. Uh, show her up here, will you, Alan? Very good, sir. Yes, I, I'm most anxious for you both to meet her. And she, in turn, is even more anxious to meet you. Now, I dined with her last night. And when I told her that you were coming here today, she insisted on meeting me. Oh, wait, no, you scoundrel. There's a twinkle in your eye. I suspect that Lady Clavering is here to consult me in my professional capacity and that you engineer the meeting. <laughs> well, uh, perhaps I might have dropped a hint. No, no, I warn you, Professor Holmes can't become involved with another case. He's completely run down. Well, don't worry, Doctor. All that Lady Clavering requires is a little advice. Advice? Oh, well, that's a different matter altogether. Yes, sir. Well, uh, I knew you wouldn't mind, Holmes. Uh... Ah, Helena, my dear, there you are. Uh, come along in. Uh, thank you, uh, Alan. Allow me to introduce Lady Clavering, uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How are you, are you gentlemen? Do you do? Now, uh, here you are, my dear. Uh, sit down here. I may as well tell you, Helena, that our little plot has already been discovered. Oh, dear. And I was just getting ready to exert all my feminine wiles in an attempt to persuade you to help me, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I'm certain that he found you utterly irresistible, my dear Lady Clavering. You flatter me, Doctor. No, 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 I, I mean it. The professor tells me that you're in need of a little advice, Lady Clavering. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I'll put my question simply. Five years ago, my husband, Sir George Clavering, left me. Left you? This is me. How uh, stupid of him. I haven't seen or heard tell of him since. I now wish to remarry. But, of course, I couldn't do that without having my husband declared legally dead. My dear Lady Clavering, I can't help feeling that a lawyer is the proper man to consult, not a detective. 
Perhaps you're suggesting that there was foul play in connection with your husband's disappearance. Oh, no, Dr. Watson. The Claverings are a strange family, self-willed and headstrong. George and I were not happy together. I think he disappeared deliberately. You reported his disappearance to the police, of course. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. But they've never been able to trace him. Uh, this kind of thing has happened in the family before, Holmes. Uh, tell them about Sir Nigel, Helena. Well, he was one of my husband's ancestors. He walked out one day in 1777 and was never seen again. Extraordinary family. Always disappearing. Dodge mm -hmm. knew of the legend. And he often threatened to do the same thing himself. But your problem, Lady Clavering, is not that of your husband's fate, but rather of your own freedom. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Well, I'm afraid my advice can be of little consolation to you. The law has specified a number of years that must elapse before anyone disappearing can be declared legally dead. I would suggest that you possess your soul in patience until that period has elapsed. Oh, dear. And I was hoping you'd be able to think of some terribly clever way of getting round the law, Mr. Holmes. Uh, Lady Clavering, uh, sometimes perhaps my methods may be unorthodox, but I assure you that getting around the law, as you put it, is a procedure I do not indulge in. Oh, dear me, now I've offended you, Mr. Holmes, and it's the last thing on earth I meant to do, I assure my you. My friend's a little touchy about matters concerning his professional honor, you know, Lady Clavering. Oh, oh, nonsense, my dear Watson. I'm not touchy and I'm not offended. And now, may I suggest we all examine the professor's latest treasures? And after that, perhaps, he'll take us for a stroll on the downs. I'm most anxious to examine those lime pits of his. The uh, lime pits are about a mile from here. It's a... Uh... Nice walk across the cliff tops. Well, I'm sorry Lady Clavering didn't want to come with us. A charming woman, even though she did rub you up the wrong way. A home. beautiful woman, Watson, but I must confess her charm eludes me. Her lack of concern about her husband's fate seemed completely unnatural. Yeah, not if you'd known her husband, Sir George Clavering. He was a tyrant and a bully, both in his home life and in the village. Hello? Who's this coming towards us? It's uh, Timmy. Daft Timmy, they call him in these parts. He isn't quite right in the head, poor fellow, but he's perfectly harmless. Has uh, two passions in life, birds and bonfires. Hello, Timmy. I've got something beautiful to show you. Oh, it's so beautiful. Well, what is it, Timmy? Look, it's in my cap. See? Oh, isn't it lovely? It's robin's egg. I found it when I was bird nesting. Did you ever see such a blue egg? It's a beauty, Timmy. Where did you find it, my boy? Down by the lime pits. Oh, I'm going to build a lovely fire on the downs tonight. I'll let you come and watch it if you give me a shilling. Now, you be careful, Timmy, or you'll be in trouble again. Timmy doesn't get in trouble anymore now. Not since he had Sir George carried away. Yeah. Sir George Clavering used to whip Timmy when he found him on the land. Uh, Timmy, tell me, how did you have uh, Sir George, uh, as you put it, uh, carried away? I told my birds about him. I told them how he used to, to beat poor Timmy. And they said they'd carry him off and drop him over the cliffs. <laughs> and, and, and that's what they did. Because he never came back again. Oh, Lord, here comes Harry, Sir George's brother. Now there'll be trouble. Timmy, you'd better run. Oh, oh no. No, Timmy can't run. He, he'll break his pretty blue egg. Timmy! Timmy! Get off my land! If I catch you here again, I'll take my riding crop to you. Timmy hasn't done anything. Go on, be off with you, do you hear? I'll tell my birds about you. That's what I'll do. Oh, don't forget my bonfire. Infernal scoundrel. Hello, Whitnell. Oh. Hello, Harry. Uh, have you met uh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson? Oh, mm. Sherlock Holmes, the professional nosy Parker, eh? Yes, yes, Helena was just telling me about you. I'm very angry with her for talking to you about my brother. Private affair, and I intend it should remain one. You understand, Holmes? Well, upon my soul. The devil with your brother, sir. And with you. I'd advise you to remember that you're not addressing a half-witted villager who can't defend himself. If you know what's good for you, you'll do what I say. Here, miss. Impertinent brute. He spoke to you as if you were a stable boy, Holmes. Oh, 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 really? He was quite refreshing. I'm reminded of an apposite quotation of my young friend James Elroy Flecker. Thine impudence have a monstrous beauty, likened to the hindquarters of an elephant. Yeah. He's almost as much disliked as his brother before him. 
Uh, tell me, does he succeed to the title when his brother is declared legally dead? Oh, yes, and, and what's more, he's Helena's unofficial fiancé, worse luck. I see. Uh, personally, I'm beginning to get a trifle bored with the affairs of the Clavering family. Let's go on to the Lime Cave, shall we? Be 50 feet below the level of the ground, aren't we, Whitnell? Well, more than that, I should say. Rock formation is most unusual, a series of caves connected by a veritable honeycomb of tunneling. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, I, I think I'll light the lantern now. It's getting dark in here, and I haven't explored this particular cave before. Yes, I've uh, had a wall cave in on me a couple of times, so you'd better watch where you're walking. Uh, there. Now we can see better. Uh, let's go deeper, shall we? Uh, but do watch your step. Hmm. It's eerie down here, isn't it? Hello. Hello, what's this in the covers here? It looks like a mummified bird of some kind. It is a beautiful specimen. Judging by its markings, a black streak here and bars of white in the tail, I'd say it was a peregrine. That's exactly what it is, a falcon. Dating back a couple of hundred years, I should say. And in a perfect state of preservation. Oh, this is a treasure. But, uh, come on, uh, let's explore deeper. There's another cave over here. If you hold the lantern up a little, I'll... Uh... Oh, I say. Good Lord, the whole wall's collapsed. Watson, you're not hurt, are you? No, 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 Holmes, I'm all right. Why, you've unearthed another cave, Dr. Watson. Uh, uh, let's go in. I, I think we can just manage to crawl through. Great Scott, I don't believe my eyes. Magnificent. Whitnall. This is a treasure indeed. A perfectly preserved body dressed in 18th century costume, powdered with an all. Yes. And there's no mistaking who it is. Look at that typical beak profile. It's a clavering, and it isn't hard to identify which one. Well, you mean the one that Lady Helena told us about this afternoon? Exactly. Without doubt, this is the body of Sir Nigel Clavering, who disappeared in 1777. Uh, let's search his pocket. We might find some identification. Yes, uh, uh, here's a snuff box of the period. And some coins. Yes, the inscription of George III is still visible on them. Hello, here's, here's his diary. This is unbelievable. What are you up to, Holmes? We're examining the body, Watson. This man was murdered. Murdered? With this wound just above the heart. Obviously inflicted with a sharp instrument, probably a dagger. This is interesting, an entirely new experience for me. The opportunity of solving an unsuspected murder committed well over a hundred years ago. Glance through that diary, Watson, will you, old chap? Let's see if the poor devil suspected his fate. Hmm. Well, hard to read. All the S's look like F's. The peculiarity of the 18th century writing. They are saying, oh, I suppose I mean saying, they are saying in the coffee houses that my brother, Harry, have been coveting my wife. But this is amazing, Holmes. See how history repeats itself. It's an exact parallel of the situation existing today. Harry is coveting his brother's wife, Helena, and Sir George has not been seen for five years. What an extraordinary incident. If it were one. As it is, it's one of the most ingenious frauds I've ever seen. The clothing appears authentic, so do the coins and the faded ink. The paper of the diary, and due to the peculiar mummification of the body... It would be almost impossible to say how long it's been here. Nevertheless, I am convinced that this is a recent corpse, and undoubtedly that of Sir George Clavering. What makes you so sure, huh? I'm writing the diary. 18th century used an S. It looked like an F, it is true, but never at the end of a word. You will recall, Watson, that you were reading H-A-F, have, for H-A-S, have. That's perfectly true, I was. Well... That would be incorrect and genuine 18th century writing. No, obviously, this is an extremely clever attempt to disguise the comparatively recent murder of Sir George Clavering. It's incredible, Holmes. And yet I believe you're right. I'm sure of it. Well, what are you going to do about it? Do? You and I, old chap, will mount guard over the body. You, my dear Whitnall, if you don't mind, will be good enough to go and fetch the police. <laughs> Holmes. Yes, old chap? 
What do you suppose is keeping the police? Whitnell must have gone over an hour. And the lantern with him. Here we are, crouching in the dark in a smelly cave, 50 feet under the cliffs, with a mummified corpse. Oh, too, Watson, but I don't... Uh-huh. Here comes the lantern. It must be Whitnell and the police. Whitnell! That you, Whitnell? That lantern's blinding me. Is that you, Whitnell? Answer, can't you? Good out, Watson! And now back to Dr. Watson and tonight's story... The case of the out-of-date murder. Well, Doctor, you certainly had me on the edge of my chair during the first part of the story. Oh, I'm glad of that, my boy. Say, what happened when Sherlock Holmes yelled out at you in the cave? I was struck from behind with a spade and knocked out. A second later, the same thing happened to Holmes. You see, we were blinded by the lantern and couldn't protect ourselves. When we came to, we found we were at the bottom of a pit. The walls were narrow and vertical, and I saw no earthly way of our getting out of the trap. But as usual, Holmes... Loving. Never mind that for the moment, old chap. Get the coat off in your shirt. Oh, well, no, oh, come on, come on, right. off with it, old huh? boy. Come on, off with it. I, I've already removed mine and tied them together. Oh, what for? Oh, dear me, that blow on your head must have been unusually severe. I'm trying to make a kind of rope, Watson, a rope to get us out of here. Oh, what's the good of a rope unless there's someone on the ledge above us to haul us out? What do you think you're performing the Indian rope trick? Is My dear it? Watson, this is no time for your rather heavy-handed humor. Why do you keep whistling like that? You've been doing it for the past 20 minutes. I'm whistling for help. Well, why not shout? The whistle carries further. Oh, yeah. Who's going to hear that? That, Timmy, I hope. Remember, he was having a bonfire on the tip-tops tonight. My whistle is that of a nightingale, a song unheard in Sussex at this time of the year. If it does answer it, I'm sure it'll bring him down here. Oh, well, I hope you're right. Seems to me that Whitnell and the police will never find us here. We shall mummify, just as a filthy murderer intended us to. Courage, Watson, I'm sure. It's worked! It's Timmy! Cutting a burning log. We're down here, Timmy! Nightingale? Pretty birdie. What are you doing down there? Timmy! I've tied these clothes together to make a rope. I'm going to throw them up. You ready? Catch! Good. He's caught it. Now, Timmy... Lower it to us. Oh, I shouldn't do this. They'll whip me. No, no, no. Nobody will whip you, Timmy. And we both want to give you a shilling to come up and see your bonfire. Oh, oh, that's different. Two shiny shillings. I'll lower the rope. Here it comes. Ah, that's it. Oh, no, 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 then. You first. All right, Timmy, pull away. Uh, here we go. Splendid! I'm up, Holmes. Now I'll lower it for you. All right. I've got it. Look out now. Here I come. Ah. Oh, thank goodness we got out of that place all right. I don't see the nightingale. Oh, oh you must have him inside your coat. Well, well, never mind. We'll all go up to my bonfire and get warm. It's such a pretty bonfire. Did you ever see a finer bonfire? Never, Timmy. It's lovely. It's the most comforting sight I've seen for the last couple of hours. Oh, just one thing's bad, though. Somebody tried to burn a book in my lovely fire. It must have been when I was off getting more wood. I, I found it when I came back, and I pulled it out of the fire and stamped on it. See, here it is. Oh, let's have a look. Hello, it's the diary that we found on the body in the lime pit. Precisely, Watson. 
Now I begin to see daylight. People shouldn't burn books. Books are nice. Books are like birds and, and bonfires. Oh, they're nice to be near. Oh, oh, your nightingale must be cold. I'll get some more twigs to burn. Well, now that that fellow's gone away for a moment, I can see why we were attacked tonight. The murderer knew that we were going to, to the caves. He was afraid that his devilish plot wouldn't stand up under your scrutiny. So he, he watched us. When we discovered the body and sent Whitnall off for the police... He knew that he'd got to get rid of us. And who do you think that somebody is, old fellow? Well, that's easy. There's only one person strong enough to have knocked us both out and shifted our bodies. The dead Sir George's brother, Harry Clavering. I think not, old fellow. Didn't you observe as we entered the caves that pickaxes and wheelbarrows were much in evidence? Yes, that's, uh, that's right. They, they were, of course. Strength was not required under the circumstances. We were extremely vulnerable in the darkness. Any man with a modicum of cunning could have disposed of us, or any woman, for that matter. Good Lord, you, you're not oh, suggesting that... Uh... Watson! Oh, what no! Why, thank heaven you're safe. Well, I've had the police with me for the last hour, but we couldn't find you. You went where I left you. True. Uh, Whitnell, I want you and the police to take me to Lady Clavering's house at once. After that, I wish to lodge information and make a charge of assault and possibly a charge of murder. <laughs> That, Lady Clavering, is the story of how we found your husband's body. Oh, horrible, Mr. Holmes. Horrible. But who in thunder could have planned such a devilish plot? Well, why did the murderer attack you and Watson? There, my dear Whitnall, you have the key to the murderer's identity. The man who so cunningly conceived and executed the murder of Sir George could never have bungled the job of disposing of Watson and myself unless he had meant to bungle it. You mean he didn't mean to kill us? Exactly. He merely wished us out of the way while the incriminating evidence was removed. You mean the diary? Of course I do. You will recall we found it partially burnt in Timmy's bonfire. Then it was Timmy who... No, 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 my dear fellow. Surely it's obvious. One person and only one. Knew that the diary was the key to the murderer's identity. The man who was present when we discovered it and detected the fraud. Great Scott, Professor Whitnell. Whitnell, you murdered my brother. Evan. Evan, you? Oh, no. I did it because I love you, Helena. All these years has been nothing in my life that meant anything but you. How could you? I thought that if George were out of the way, I could make you care for me. And when I realized that you loved Harry, I, I was mad with jealousy. And so I planned to conceal George's body forever. It was a clever plan. You said so yourself, Holmes. If it hadn't been for you, it would have worked. Yes, it was diabolically clever, Whitnall, but I'm afraid that no amount of cleverness now can prevent you from paying for your crime. Sir George... I suggest that you instruct the police to come in. Our work is done. Holmes, Holmes, look there on the point. Timmy's bonfire is still burning away. Yes. Timmy's a simple fellow with simple tastes. Why are you so gloomy? You solved the case brilliantly. My dear fellow, my, my faith in human nature has been sadly shaken, old chap. Evan Whitnall was a good friend and an old one. Hard to be instrumental in sending him to the gallows. Well, he richly deserved yes, it. Yes, yes, I know he did. That's quite true. But it's depressing just the same. Come on. Let's continue our walk home across the downs. I heard Sir Harry offering you a fee. Did you take it? No, I didn't. But I did accept his offer of an acre of land on the downs over there near the Abbey Ruins. You can see them silhouetted against the sky. An acre of land? What on earth would you do with that? Well, when I retire, and I shall retire soon, I've often thought of bee farming. This would be a heavenly spot for such a venture. Well, I can't imagine you as a beekeeper. Oh, why not? After a life spent unraveling the tangled affairs of human beings, it would be soothing in the twilight of one's days to study the exact and predictable behavior of bees. Singing masons... Building roofs of gold. Oh, well. One day, perhaps. Perhaps. One day. Well, Doctor, that was a swell story. You know, I'm sure glad we get together like this once a week. Oh, thank you very much. Next week, why not come over a little earlier for dinner? Oh, no, I, I wouldn't think of having you go through all that trouble. Oh, well, of course, if you feel that way, well, 
Say, aren't you going to coax me? <laughs> <laughs> to tell you the truth, I, I knew I wouldn't have to coax you. Mr. Bartell, I was just going to show you the two thick steaks that I've got frozen in my refrigerator. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I'll also put aside a bottle of Petri Burgundy. Well, in which case, I'll bring along a very hearty appetite. If you pick the steak, I know it's good, and when it's Petri wine, you know that's got to be good, too. Now, Dr. Watson, what story do you have lined up for us next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you an adventure that occurred to Holmes and me in the shadowy depths of the Limehouse District in London. It's a strange tale of death and terror. I call the story The Eyes of Mr. Layton. Well, Doctor, we'll be sure not to miss it. And meanwhile, don't you forget you promised to contribute to the National War Fund. The National War Fund? Of course, Mr. Bartell. It's a must. The money you give to your war fund not only helps the men and women in our armed forces, and it not only helps our allies, but that money goes to work right in your own community, helping make possible many relief and welfare agencies in your own hometown. So let's all be generous in victory. Give to your community war fund. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of Wisteria Lodge. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. And now for our weekly doctor's visit. Let's see. No, 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 Mr. Bartell. Don't say let's see if he's expecting us. You know, I always expect you at this time on Monday evenings, my boy. So draw up your usual chair and settle down. Thanks, Doctor. Ah, that's it. Ah, all alone this evening, Doctor? Where are the puppies? Out on the patio. They had a most unfortunate encounter with a dead seal on the beach this afternoon. In consequence, they're a little uh, malodorous, shall we say. <laughs> In that case, Doctor, perhaps we'd better change the subject. So, suppose I ask you about tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Well, my boy, as I told you last week, the story took place in the foul alleyways of Limehouse. It was there on a foggy December evening in 1890 that my story began. An old friend and patient of mine, Isa Whitney, had disappeared, and his distraught wife had come to me for help. Knowing the man to be the victim of the shocking habit of taking opium, I suspected that I might find him in one of the vile dens inhabited by the dregs of the waterfront. And so, Mr. Bartell, about five o'clock on that December evening, I began my search. After an hour of fruitless wanderings, I found myself in a vile alley called Upper Swandham Lane. I could hear the distant moans of the river boats as I walked, eyes alert, and hand on the revolver in my coat pocket. <laughs> Suddenly, I saw a steep flight of steps leading down to a black gap, like the mouth of a cave. I walked down them. The steps were worn hollow in the center by the ceaseless tread of stumbling feet. I reached the bottom. A door faced me, and above it, a flickering oil lamp winked warnings at me. I found the latch and lifted it. The door squeaked open protestingly. And I entered. There was a tinkle of Chinese wind bells as I walked towards a long, low room. A strange sight met my eyes. Through the gloom, thick and heavy with the brown opium smoke, I saw that the room was terraced with wooden berths, 
like the forecastle of an emigrant ship. Out of the shadows, there glimmered little red circles of light, now bright, now faint, as a burning poison waxed or waned in the metal pipes. Bodies lay in strange, fantastic poses, bowed shoulders, bent knees, heads thrown back. The attendant came up to me with a pipe and beckoned me to an empty berth. I haven't come here to smoke your filthy drug. I'm looking for a friend, Mr. Isa Whitney. No, Mr. Whitney here. Oh, I'm going to search the place. You must not disturb the priest. I'm carrying a revolver, so you'd better not argue with me, my good man. Out of the way. I searched that filthy den, but found no trace of my missing friend. As I was leaving in despair, a long shaking hand reached out and plucked at my sleeve. I turned, and there sprawled in a berth was the wreckage of a man. His gaunt face yellow and twitching his clothes filthy and ragged, and the pupil of his eyes like pinpoints. He spoke to me in a thin, quavering voice. Mr. Reverend Saint, get me out of here. Now, look here, my man. Don't say you won't help me, Governor. Ain't you got no heart? Please help me, Governor. Take me out of here. Strike me pink, I'm going to me, I tell you. Oh, what must you expect if you indulge in this filthy habit? Take me out of here, Governor. I'll go straight this time. Cross me out, I will. Oh, very well. Come along with me. I suppose it's my duty to help you. Ah, oh, bless you, Governor. Here, you are. Here now, give me your arm. You cannot take him away. He owe me money. That's a bleeding lie. I paid him when I come in, I did. He cannot go with you, mister. You remember what I said about my revolver, you blackguard? If I have any more trouble with you, I'll, I'll fetch the police. Come along. He owe me money. He owe me money. Infernal scoundrel owe me money. You tell him all proper, money. Governor. And I hope you didn't. Now, look here, my good man. I'll give you a square meal, some advice, and some medical attention. But the rest Never mind the advice, Watson, but I'll take you up on that square meal. Holmes! Yes, I'm very glad to see you, old fellow. What brought you to that filthy den of iniquity? Oh, this is me. I want to find a friend. And I, an enemy. (laughs) Your disguise is wonderful. It completely fooled me. But I'm afraid the proprietor was beginning to penetrate it. That's why I staged the little rescue scene. Had I been recognized, my life wouldn't have been worth an hour's purchase. How long had you been there? Why were you there? Come on, Holmes. Tell me all about it. With pleasure, old chap. But first, let's find a a chop house. I want that square meal you promised me. Excellent meal, Watson. Yes, you're surprisingly good for such a shoddy-looking place. Well, Holmes, now perhaps you'll tell me what you were doing in that opium den. I've already told you my story. I'm shadowing a most unusual criminal. A man who haunts the opium dens. Yet I know that he himself is not an addict. I don't see anything very criminal about that. He might be looking for a thrill, or perhaps he's one of those writer fellows or something. But this man pretends to be an addict. I watched him closely. He fakes his smoking. And grease paint has enabled him to simulate the characteristic pallor of a drug victim. He even affects the typical mannerism of nose scratching. But it's his eyes that give him away. Mm, the pupils are wide open, I suppose. Exactly, old fellow. Whereas, if he were really addicted to the drug, they would, as you know, be contracted. I myself always treat my eyes with a special, well, a special kind of drop on the occasion when, uh, well, I have to enter these dens. Well, why does a man haunt an opium den in order not to smoke? That, my dear Watson, is the problem that I intend to solve. Well, perhaps the fellow's a policeman or a private detective like yourself, Holmes. I've already checked on those possibilities. No, Watson, I believe there is only one answer. I believe the man is planning a murder. A murder? It's a tempting setting for a murder. Your victim is an addict, drugged and helpless. Your witnesses and are in an equal state of befuddlement. The proprietor is anxious to cover up the crime because of the police. Thank you. Yes, Holmes. Now, the question is, who is the intended victim? That, my dear Watson, is why I've been shadowing this man. Unfortunately, he was not present in the den we just left, but I intend to continue my search. Holmes, uh, can, can I help you? My, my wife's away, you know. You know, it's, it's a long time since we were on a case together. I should be delighted, my dear chap. I've missed you sadly during the past few months. And I, you, Holmes... What's the next move? Back to Baker Street, old fellow. My disguise is wearing thin and I must contrive a new one. New disguise, eh? Well, which one shall it be, Watson? Well, how about the old flower cellar? <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> well, it's 
pretty fresh body. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, no, 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 my dear fellow, no. Hardly appropriate for an opium dinner. In any case, the clothes are so wretchedly uncomfortable. Well, how about the music hall singer? Oh, that chap, yes. Oh, I don't want to be beside the seaside. Oh, I don't want to be beside the sea. I don't want to stroll along the prom, prom, prom where the brass band plays tiddly um. Oh, confound it. Who can that be? You weren't expecting anyone, were you? No. So this is just like the old days. The doorbell ringing, Mrs. Hudson toddling off and bringing up some poor devil in trouble and... You say that rather wistfully, old fellow. Don't tell me that you repent of marriage. No, of course not, Holmes. Mary's a perfect darling and I couldn't be happier. Just the same. <laughs> it is rather fun to be back here again. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? Uh, it's a gentleman, sir. He gave me this card. Says he's very anxious to see you. Hmm. Wayne J. Layton, President, Layton Corporation, Chicago, United States. Ask him to come up, will you, Mrs. Hudson? Aye, sir. Well, it's quite the cold times to see you back here, Dr. Well, Hudson. That's just what I was saying myself, Mrs. Hudson. Hmm. Mr. Layton has scribbled a message on the back of his card. If a thousand pounds for a week's work interests you, you'll see me. A thousand pounds? Big fish, Watson. Very big fish. Uh, this way, sir. Uh, thank you. Oh. How do you do? Mr. Layton? I guess you're Sherlock Holmes. You guessed correctly, sir. Excuse me. Oh, Mrs. Hudson, just a moment, Mrs. Hudson. Hi, Mr. Holmes. Sit down, won't you, Mr. Layton? My name's Watson, Dr. Watson. I'm Sherlock Holmes' colleague. Uh, yes, I've, I've heard about you, too. Uh, like a cigar, Doctor? It's a good one. Sent me back three shillings. Oh, three shillings? Oh, thank you. That's very nice, sir. Just put one. Oh, no, three I shillings. Oh, oh. Splendid. And now, Mr. Layton, may I ask what brings you here? I'll talk fast and to the point. I'm a businessman. I like to do things in a business way. I have a chance to control the guano deposits at the Republic of San Pedro. Their minister will be in London tomorrow, and if it weren't for one thing, I know that I could swing the deal and get the concession. And what is that one thing, Mr. Layton? The deal is secrecy. I thought no one knew about it, but when I got here, I found out that my biggest business rival has gotten wind of what's going on. He's an Englishman. I've never met him, but uh, he's right here in London. Now, I'm not going to tell you his name. Not until you give me your word that you'll work for me. Just what you wish me to do, Mr. Layton. Get this rival of mine and keep him out of circulation for a week. I don't care how you do it, and I won't ask. In a week's time, I'll give you the other half of this 500 pounds I brought with me. Oh, good, Scott. What kind of uh, detective Watson, give you... Mr. Layton his hat and gloves. That's it. Thanks, old fellow. Goodbye, sir. Uh, what are you doing, throwing me out? I can't think where you uh, gathered the impression that I indulged in kidnapping. Once again, goodbye, sir. And here, sir, you can take back your cigar. Well, if you don't want some easy money, I'll soon find someone else that does. This is the last you'll see of me, Mr. Holmes. Life is full of little consolations. Hmm. Some people seem to think that money can... Watson, run. the game's afoot. Mr. Layton is the man I've been seeking. The man who pretends to be an opium smoker. Why, well, it you let him get away. Here, I'll go after him. No, 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 no. Don't worry. I've already arranged for that. Oh, how? When I left the room just now to talk to Mrs. Hudson, I was intending to tell her to summon some of my band of street urchins. You know, the Baker Street Irregulars. When she informed me that half a dozen of them were in the kitchen at this very moment, partaking of one of her incomparable steak and kidney pies, the rest should be obvious. You left instructions for one of them to shadow Mr. Layton when he left her. Elementary, my dear Watson. Oh, don't tell me that Layton back again. No, I think not. I should say that at the moment he's just about to walk out of the front door. No, I think we shall have another visitor. And judging by the commotion, the incoming and the outgoing visitors know each other and are not on the best of terms. Well, it sounds to me as if they're having a fight. Here comes Mrs. Hudson to tell us about it. Come in, come in. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you've got another visitor. Uh, so I gathered. Mrs. Hudson, you gave my instructions to one of the boys? I did that, sir. Young Wiggins was going to follow the gentleman. Well, Mrs. Hudson, what was all that commotion about downstairs just now? Oh, it was the two gentlemen shouting at each other. Him that was leaving and the one that was waiting on the doorstep. And who is our new visitor, Mrs. Hudson? Here's his card, sir. Oh, thank you. Linton Chumley, 9 Belgrave Square. Well... Ask him to come up, will you, Mrs. Hudson? Very well, Mr. Holmes. Oh, one thing more. Yes, sir. Uh, please instruct another of the Baker Street Irregulars to follow this Linton Chumley when he leaves here and report to me. All right, sir. Hmm. You're taking no chances, Holmes, eh? You're having this fellow shadow, too. Leighton is a potential murderer. Of that, I'm convinced. This Mr. Chumley might possibly be his intended victim... While we are talking to him, Watson, old fellow, I want you to be sure to look at the condition of his eyes. Yeah, I certainly will. Come in. Oh, good evening, Mr. Chumley. 
Are you Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I am. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Uh, that was Wayne Layton that was just left here, uh, wasn't it? Uh, won't you sit down, sir? Uh, thank you. I don't want to sit down. All right. You needn't answer my question, but I know it was Layton. I have never met him, but I've seen his picture in the newspapers. Oh, very well, then, sir. It was Wayne Layton. Ah, I know why he came to you. He's, he's trying to have me put out of the way while he closes that deal on the San Pedro and Guana concession. Now, look here, Holmes. You've got to be on my side. Whatever fee he offered you to dispose of me, I'll double it if you'll take care of him for a few days. Oh, dear me, this is becoming monotonous. Watson? The hat and gloves? Thank you, old chap. That's right. Good night, Mr. Chumley. Uh, look here, Holmes. I'll, I'll treble his fee. I'll quadruple it. My dear Mr. Chumley, I have accepted no fee from Mr. Layton. I don't propose to accept one from you. Your hat and glove, sir? Uh, that man is out to kill me, Holmes. Well, if you won't help me, I'll go to the police. That's an excellent idea, Mr. Chumley. Again, good night. Did you notice his eyes, Watson? Yes, the pupils were contracted. He's obviously an opium addict. And also a potential corpse. Well, what do we do now? Wait for the irregulars to report? No, you'll return home for your medical bag. I have a feeling that you'll need it before the night is out. Then come back here. If I've gone before you return, I'll send one of the irregulars to bring you to wherever I may be. Wait until you receive a message from me. On your way, old chap. There's work ahead of us. <laughs> Wiggins, you're certain that this is the place that Mr. Holmes told you to bring me to? Oh, yes, Dr. Watson. The corner of Swanham Line and Brixel Street, Mr. Holmes said. Yeah, well, this is the spot, all right. I don't see any sign of him. Hello? This old woman coming towards us. <laughs> So that's the disguise he chose. Oh, spare me a few coppers, will you, mister? <laughs> My feet hurt something awful, and I ain't had a bite of food all day. Oh, no. no, you don't, Holmes. You can't fool me this time. As a matter of fact, your makeup isn't very convincing. You hardly look like a woman, and nobody's nose could be quite as red as that. Don't look like a woman, don't I? <laughs> My nose is too red, is it? I'll take that. Oh, no, steady, look My out. My feet's funny, but poor old woman has plight in me. Oh, I'm don't sorry, like madam. I, I didn't mean to insult you. <laughs> well, matey, she gave you a bit of work for all right, didn't she? Ah, box your ears. No mistake about it. You mind your own business. <laughs> and anyhow, why aren't you aboard your ship at this time of night? Because I'm not a sailor, Watson. It's Mr. Holmes. Great heavens, Holmes. I wish you, you wouldn't confuse me like this. I'd never have recognized you. My dear Watson, when you're able to recognize me, it will indeed be the beginning of the end. When your eagle eye penetrates my disguise, I shall realize that my retirement is imminent. But enough of this. See that house opposite? You mean the ramshackle place with the broken, tiled roof? Yes, I gave the irregulars instructions to let me know at once if our two quarries ever enter the same house at the one time. They're inside there now. And I'm going in after them. Be careful, Holmes. I'd better come along with you. Can't I come too, Mr. No, Holmes? No, certainly not. Both keep watch outside. If I need any help, I'll smash one of the windows, and then you can come in after me. Wait here for me. I don't expect I'll be very long. But... I'll be here, Holmes. Don't worry about me. Just take good care of yourself. It's one o'clock, Doctor. Yes, I know, Wiggins. He's been in there half an hour. I'm beginning to get worried. Start going off, No, no, sir. no, Wiggins. You know Mr. Holmes. When he gives orders, he likes some... There's a signal for help. Keep watching the house, Wiggins. I'll be out in five minutes. Go for the police. Right, sir, sir. All right, Holmes, all right. I'm coming. You have searched my house from basement to attic. Why do you not give up? I tell you again, there has been no one here tonight. But my friend came in here half an hour ago. I saw him, and before that, two other men are known to have come in here. Uh, if that is so, then where are they? Three men cannot vanish. That's just the point, you scoundrel. Out of the way. I'm going to search this hovel again. I'm not leaving here until I find Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> And now back to Dr. Watson and tonight's story, The Eyes of Mr. Layton. Well, what happened next, Doctor? 
When you searched the house for the second time, did you find any trace of Sherlock Holmes or the two rival businessmen? No, Mr. Bartell, I'm afraid I didn't. What did you do? I told Wiggins to report the matter to the nearest police station and then rattle back to Baker Street in a handsome cab as fast as I could. When I arrived at the old familiar doorstep, I wrenched at the bell in a frenzy of anxiety. Finally, the door opened, and there stood Mrs. Hudson. Dr. Watson, what is it, sir? Why, you're as white as a ghost. Mr. Holmes, is he here? I, sir, came in half an hour ago. He was dressed as a sailor and was half carrying some drunken friend of his. Oh, thank heavens he's safe. I'll go up. All right, sir. I want to know, Jack. There you are. Holmes, I can't tell you how glad I am to see you. Who's that, uh, that lying on the sofa? Well, I'll be back, Watson. Though I'm afraid the poor devil's done for. Great Scott, it's Wayne Layton, the American fella. With a knife wound between his ribs. See what you can do for him, will you? Right. This is extraordinary, Holmes. You said that Layton was a potential murderer. And now he's a victim himself. The biter bit, eh, old chap? Yes, he's still breathing, but he, he hasn't a chance. I'll try him with an injection of strychnine. Holmes, how did you get his body out of the house? I, I searched the place from top to bottom. I... I found no trace of any of you. When I went in, I found the stabbing had already taken place. The proprietor then bribed me, or rather the broken-down sailor he took me for, to smuggle the body out through the secret stairway leading to the wards at the back of the house. Well, there's no trace of Chumley there? No, he must have left before me by the same exit. Well, then you smashed the window and bolted. Yes, I knew that I could count on you to hold the fort while I was getting the body away. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Try to say something, Watson. I, yes, the injection's uh, beginning to take effect. Uh, yes, Mr. Layton? Uh, what are you trying to say? Uh, tell us who stabbed you, uh, sir. Shh, shh, shh. Lips are moving. Uh, my, uh, my, man, do I. Uh, uh, He's dead, Holmes. Yes, but he gave us the clue to the murderer's identity. How? In the word he mumbled just before he died. Well, sounded to me as if he said Mandalay. Precisely, old fellow. Never did a corpse give us a clearer instruction as to our next and final move. And that is? Back to Limehouse, Watson. Back to Limehouse. Ah, uh, here we are. This must be the place. What's this? Another opium den? Yes, I knew that since Chumley refrained from smoking earlier on in the night in order to keep his faculties alert for murder, that an enormous reaction would set in. He'd have to find a den at once, and beyond question, a different one from that in which the murder was committed. But how do you know that he's inside here? Well, just before you returned to Baker Street tonight, I had a message from one of my irregulars. He tracked him here after he escaped from the scene of the stabbing. That was a couple of hours ago. He might have slipped away again. No, Watson, tonight he came to drown his senses with a wretched drug. He'll be here. Come on. Second injection of caffeine should bring him round. He's heavily drugged, but I think it'll work. Surprising what a five-pound note will do, isn't it? Yes, the proprietor let us bring Chumley into this private room and he... Shh, shh, shh. Mm -hmm. Look, he, he's coming mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. who, who, who are you? Who, what, what do you want? You remember me, sir? I'm Sherlock Holmes. Oh, uh, yes. Yes, I, I remember you. You're in serious trouble, Mr. Chumley. Very serious trouble. Uh, trouble? What, what trouble? Wayne Layton didn't die. Oh. He's badly wounded, but he's going to live. He's at Baker Street now. He wants to go to the police and give evidence. You, you've got to get me out of this, Holmes. I'll, I'll pay you anything. Uh, Ten thousand, twenty thousand. Why did you stab Layton? He, he was in my way. I wanted the San Pedro concession. I, I meant to kill him. But we can fix it up now, can't we, Holmes? We can fix it up yes, now. Yes, we can fix it beautifully, sir. As neat a murder confession as ever I listened to, Holmes. Exactly. Come along, Mr. Chumley. I think some night air will be good for you. We'll take you for a nice drive to Scotland Yard. <laughs> You 
some kippers, gentlemen. You've both been up all night, and I'm sure you can do it. That's very thoughtful of you, Mrs. Hudson. Yes, indeed it is. Uh, what is Mrs. Watson going to say when she finds you've been out all night? Oh, don't you worry about that, Mrs. Hudson. She's very understanding. <laughs> it's lucky for you that she is. Well, I'll go and leave you to your breakfast. Holmes. Yes, dear fellow? There's only one thing that puzzles me about this case. Oh, what's that? When Leighton was dying, he muttered the word Mandalay. How did that give you the key to the murderer's identity? Oh, the dead American had never met Mr. Chumley, you remember, except when they bumped into each other in our hallway. Yes, he told us that he recognized him from the newspaper photograph. Being an American, he had no reason to know that the name Chumley is in no way pronounced the way it is spelt. Oh, Joe, I never thought of that. Chumley. That name spelt C-H-O-L, Chow, M-O-N, Mon, D-E-Dur, L-E-Y. Chol Mondele. Mondele. Precisely, old fellow. What you thought to be Mandalay was really Chol Mondele, the name of the murderer. What an amazing case. You did a remarkable job, Holmes. <laughs> I'm, I'm beginning to be confoundedly sleepy. Well, why not sleep, old chap? Your old uh, room's all ready for you. Are you going to take a nap? Oh, dear me, no. Hmm? I have much too busy a day ahead of me. Let me look at my engagement book. Uh, Baxter Square murder. Mm -hmm. I put the police on the track. The Duchess of uh, Ferrers. I've got her material. The princess who was about to run away from home. Good gracious me, let her run. The Pope's cameos. Ah, yes, yes. His holiness must not be kept waiting. Uh, can, uh, can I help you again, Holmes? Uh, Mary doesn't return <laughs> until tomorrow. Well, I thought you were sleepy, old fellow. Sleepy rubbish. I never felt more wide awake in my life. That was a swell story, Doctor. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And it was really funny when you mistook that old lady for Holmes and she slapped your face. It wasn't very funny at all. <laughs> I ah, sure it was. Come on, admit it, Doctor. Well, she did look like Holmes in disguise, you know, and you would have made the same mistake that I did. Okay, okay. Her nose was ridiculously red, and she did look like a man. Uh, look, Doctor, forget I ever said anything. Hmm? I won't say another word. I I'll keep my mouth closed forever. Oh, come on, I wouldn't do that. Mr. Bartell? Mr. Bartell? Uh, won't you even open your mouth to uh, finish your wine? Your... Your Petri wine? Okay, you win. You know I'll open my mouth for Petri wine any time. And now, Dr. Watson, what story are you going to tell us next week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a most unusual adventure that Holmes and I had in the heart of the English countryside. It concerns a corpse, a missing revolver, and a beautiful girl who was frightened of her own shadow. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Man with the Twisted Lip. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And now for our weekly visit with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. You're a bit late. 
I've been keeping some dinner hot for you. Here, pull up your chair and, and join me. That's very nice of you. Thanks, Doctor. Are you all set with tonight's story? Yes, my boy. I'm all set, as you call it. As a matter of fact, I was going over my notes on the case just before you arrived. Uh, last week, you hinted that a beautiful girl figured prominently in your adventure. That's quite right, Mr. Bartell. An extremely beautiful girl. In fact, I often used to say to Sherlock Holmes that if I'd been a little younger at the time, I might... Oh, well, you haven't come here to <laughs> listen to my personal reminiscences. You want to hear the story that I called The Problem of Tor Bridge. That's what you promised us, Doctor. How did it begin? On a windy morning in October... In, 18, in the 1890s, it was. As I was dressing, I observed how the last remaining leaves were being whirled away from the solitary plane tree which graced the yard behind our Baker Street house. I descended to breakfast, prepared to find my companion in depressed spirits, for, like all great artists, he was easily impressed by his surroundings. But, to my surprise, he was in an unusually gay mood. As I entered the room, he looked up at me and, with a, with a smile... My dear fellow, hope you slept well. Splendidly, thank you, sir. I'm so glad. Well, you're very solicitous this morning. I, I think you must have got a new case. <laughs> Am I right? The faculty of deduction is certainly contagious. Yes, I have a new case. After a month of trivialities and stagnation, the wheels revolve once more. Good. Tell me all about it. Well, as yet, there isn't much to tell. Have you ever heard of Neil Gibson? Neil Gibson? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Something to do with gold mining, isn't he? A great deal to do with it, my dear fellow. In fact, he's considered the greatest mining magnet in the world. About five years ago, he bought a large estate in Hampshire. Perhaps you've read of the tragic death of his wife. Oh, yes, of course. I remember the case now. She was murdered by a jealous governess who was in her employ, wasn't she? That point will be decided when the lady in question, uh, Grace Dunbar, I believe her name is, comes up for trial at the forthcoming Winchester Assizes. In any case, it's hard for me to see... What I can do for my client at this late date. Your client? Oh, yes. I forgot I hadn't told you. I'm getting into your involved habit of telling a story backwards. Mm. Better read this letter. Came this morning. Oh, let's have a look. Dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Miss Dunbar is innocent. I can't see the finest woman in the world go to her death without doing everything possible to save her. I shall call on you at 10.30 tomorrow morning to discuss the matter yours faithfully, Neil Gibson. Good gracious me. There you have it, Watson. That is the gentleman I await. Uh, do you know anything about his dead wife? Only the, what I've been reading in the papers. Apparently, she was past her prime, which was the more unfortunate as this Miss Dunbar, who superintended the education of the two young children, is reputed to be a very attractive young lady. <laughs> the eternal triangle, eh? Well, where did the murder take place? On Gibson's estate in Hampshire. His wife was found in the grounds nearly half a mile from the manor house, late at night, clad in her dinner dress with a shawl over her shoulders, and... A revolver bullet through her brain. Any weapon found near her? No, there were no clues found at the scene of the crime. What made them suspect the governess? Well, in the first place, there was some very incriminating evidence. A revolver with one discharged chamber, the caliber corresponding with a bullet in the dead woman's head, was found on the floor in Miss Dunbar's wardrobe. Oh, was it? Pretty damaging evidence, Holmes. Mm, so the coroner thought. And to make the case even blacker against Miss Dunbar, the dead woman had a note on her making an appointment at that very spot. And the note was signed by the governess. It seems obvious that the girl's guilty. And the motive's clear. Mr. Gibson would be a great catch for a young girl. Love, fortune, power, all dependent on one life. And possibly, Watson, but circumstantial evidence can be very misleading at times. Ah, as the gentleman in question, unless I'm very much mistaken, considerably before his time. I can see him from the window here. Formidable-looking fuller. Must be well over six foot tall. <laughs> Judging by the way he's wrenching at that doorbell, he's a man with a violent temper. Mrs. Hudson's opening the door to him now. Uh, meet him on the stairs, will you, old chap? It'll save Mrs. Hudson a journey. Right, sure, Holmes. Up here, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. All right. Are you Mr. Sherlock Holmes? No, no, indeed. I'm his colleague, Dr. Watson. Uh, come along in, won't you? Mr. Neil Gibson, I presume? That's right. So you're the great Sherlock Holmes, huh? <laughs> the adjective is your own, Mr. Gibson. Sit down, won't you? By the way, you must speak uh, quite freely in front of Dr. Watson. Hmm. Well, I may as well begin by telling you that money means nothing to me in this case. You can burn it if it's any use to you in lighting the truth. Miss Dunbar is innocent, and it's up to you to prove it. Just name your fee. Now, Mr. Gibson, my professional charges are on a fixed scale. I don't vary them, except when I omit them altogether. Very well. I imagine that you've read the newspaper reports of the coroner's inquest. Yes, very thoroughly. I don't see that I can add anything that'll help you. But if there are any questions you'd like to ask, I'll answer them. Thank you. 
First, now what were the exact relations between you and Miss Dunbar? I suppose you're within your rights in asking such questions, Mr. Holmes? We will agree to suppose so, shall we? Then I can assure you that my relations with Miss Dunbar were always those of an employer towards a young lady with whom he never conversed or even saw, except in the company of his children. Oh. Rather a busy man, Mr. Gibson, and I've no time or taste for aimless conversation. I wish you good morning. What the devil do you mean by this, Mr. Holmes? My dear sir, the case is difficult enough without your giving me false information. Meaning that I lie, sir? I was trying to express it as delicately as possible, but <clears throat> if you insist on the word, I won't contradict you. Why, you confound... Don't be noisy, Mr. Gibson. Please don't be noisy. I find that after breakfast, even the smallest argument is unsettling. I suggest that a stroll in the morning air and a little quiet thought will be greatly to your advantage. I suppose I can't make you take the case, <clears throat> but you've done yourself no good this morning, Mr. Holmes. I've broken stronger men than you. No man ever crossed me and was the better for it. Good morning, Mr. Gibson. You have a great deal yet to learn. <laughs> On my soul, Holmes, you were unusually severe with him. <laughs> I dislike liars, Watson, and I cannot tolerate arrogance, particularly when it's coupled with great wealth. Well, how did you know about his relations with the governor? I didn't. It was pure bluff. Bluff? <laughs> it certainly worked. Do you think he'll come back? Oh, of course he will. He needs my help too badly. He'll probably change his mind before he's halfway down the stairs. Come in. <clears throat> Ah, <laughs> Mr. Gibson. I was just saying to Dr. Watson that I was certain you'd be back. I've been thinking it over, Mr. Holmes, and I feel that perhaps I was hasty in taking your remarks amiss. Just the same, I can assure you that the relations between Miss Dunbar and me really don't affect this case. Surely that is for me to decide, Mr. Gibson. You see, Mr. Gibson, my friend is like a doctor. He wants every symptom before he can give his diagnosis. Fire away, Mr. Holmes. What is it you want to know? The truth. I can give it to you in very few words. To begin with, I met my wife when I was gold mining in Brazil. Uh, your wife was Brazilian by birth, wasn't she, sir? Yes, doctor, and very beautiful. Well, to make a long story short, I fell in love and married her and brought her to England. After a few years, I realized that we had nothing, absolutely nothing, in common. And then I suppose this young governess, Miss Dunbar, arrived on the scene. That's right, Mr. Holmes. Well... The story should be obvious to you from there. You uh, fell in love with this girl, I suppose, sir. Who could help it? Did you suggest marriage to her? Yes. Though I knew that my wife would never divorce me. I see. Then you made an utterly insincere proposition to her. Now, look here, Mr. Holmes. I came to you on a question of evidence, not of morals. I'm not asking for your criticism. It's only the young lady's sake that uh, forces me to touch your case at all. Now, tell me, sir. Uh, what is your own opinion as to Miss Dunbar's guilt? It's very black against her, I can't deny that. One explanation of the tragedy did come into my head, Mr. Holmes. I give it to you for what it's worth. Pray continue, Mr. Gibson. My wife was bitterly jealous. She was half crazy with hatred. She might have planned to murder Miss Dunbar, or we'll say to threaten the girl with a revolver and so frighten her into leaving us. There might have been a struggle in which the gun exploded and gone off and shot my wife, who was mm -hmm. holding it. Well, that possibility has already occurred to me. It's the only obvious alternative to deliberate murder. The revolver, Holmes. It was found on the floor of the governess's wardrobe. Well, Mr. Gibson, I should like to examine your house and the scene of the murder as soon as possible. Certainly, Mr. Holmes. Sergeant Coventry of the local police is still down there. He'll give you any help you may need. Excellent. Watson, old fellow, I'm out with the timetable. We're catching the next fast train to Winchester. <laughs> If I have to have someone else on the case, I'd rather have you, Mr. Holmes. The yard gets called in, then, then we local police lose us all credit for success. <laughs> Generally gets blamed for the failures. Now I've heard that you play straight. <laughs> I never appear in the matter at all, Sergeant Coventry. If I can clear it up, I don't ask to even have my name mentioned. Well, that's handsome of you, I'm sure, and I, I know your friend Dr. Watson can be trusted, too. Oh, don't worry, my dear fellow. We won't steal any of your thunder. Well, that's nice and friendly of you, Doctor. Well, come on, gentlemen. I'll walk you down to the bridge. That's where we found Mrs. Gibson's body. It's not far from the house here. Well, I must say, Mr. Gibson has a beautiful estate. It must be 60 or, or 70 acres. Oh, nearly twice that, Doctor. The woods back of the house there belongs to him, too. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Sergeant? There's a question I'd like to ask you. A question I wouldn't ask anyone else. Then please ask it. Don't you think there might be a case against Mr. Gibson himself, sir? I've been considering that possibility. That there, Miss Dunbar's a bit of all right. 
If you ask me, he wanted his wife out of the way, and the pistol she was shot with was his pistol, you know. Uh, was, uh, was that fact uh, proven? Yes, Doctor. It was one of a pair that he had. One of a pair? Where's the other? Well, Mr. Gibson has a lot of firearms. We never quite matched that particular pistol. But the box was made for two. Well, if it was one of a pair, surely you'd be able to match it. Well, we have them all laid out at the house if you want to look them over. And we'll do that later. Ah, this, I presume, is Tor Bridge. That's right, sir. Found Mrs. Gibson's body lying right here at the approach to the bridge. I see. I gathered from the newspaper reports that the shot was fired at very close quarters. Yes, sir, very close. Near the right temple, wasn't it? Just behind it, sir. How did the body lie, Sergeant? Oh, on its back, Doctor. No trace of a struggle, no marks, no weapon. The note from Miss Dunbar was clutched in her left hand. Clutched, you say? Yes, sir. We, we could hardly open the fingers to get at it. Ah, that's of the greatest importance. It excludes the idea that anyone could have placed the note there after death in order to furnish a false clue. What did the note say, Sergeant? Little enough, Doctor. It just said, uh, I will be at... Tor Bridge at 9 o'clock, and it was signed Grace Dunbar. Did Miss Dunbar admit writing it? Oh, yes, sir. What was her explanation? She wouldn't say nothing. Said she was saving her defense for the trial. Yes, it seems odd that Mrs. Gibson was still clutching that note. Seems perfectly natural to me. Oh, come now, old fellow. Argue the thing out logically. If the letter is genuine, it was certainly received sometime before the tragedy, say an hour or two. Why then was the dead woman still clasping it in her left hand? Why should she carry it so carefully? She certainly didn't need to refer to the note at all at the interview. Doesn't it strike you as rather strange? Well, now you put it that way, it does seem a little peculiar. Hello. Did you notice this, Sergeant? Oh, you mean that chip out of that stone on the underside of the parapet of the bridge, sir? Yes, I noticed it. Uh, didn't think nothing of it, though. Well, it isn't a very large chip. Yes, but it's been done recently. That is how the stone work is white just here. It took some violence to do that. Hand me a cane, Watson, will you? Here you are, Philip. Thanks. Yes. It's a hard knock. And in a curious place, too. But it's 15 feet from where we found the body, Mr. Dell. Yes, Holmes, I don't see how it could have any connection with Mrs. Gibson's well, murder. It hasn't. But it's a point worth noting. There were no footprints, you say, Sergeant? None, Mr. Holmes. The ground was as hard as iron. It it's been a very dry summer and we haven't had any rain to speak yes, of this. pity. Mm. Well, Sergeant, I'm much obliged to you, and now I think we'll get back to the house. Right. Uh, Cesar will show you where the firearms are, sir. Oh, uh, who is Cesar? Oh, funny kind of a bloke. Brazilian, he is. Brazilian, eh? Like Mrs. Gibson? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Uh, comes from the same town that she does, as a matter of fact. Something very fishy about him, if you ask me. Now, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I'm going to take a little stroll around the grounds. You started me on a new train of thought in this case, Mr. Holmes. Oh, oh. I'm delighted, Sergeant. I'll get back to the house. I see. And these are all the firearms in Mr. Gibson's possession, eh, Cesar? Mm. Except for the revolver that is missing from the case. Yes, so I say I see him. Well, I've never seen such a collection of guns and revolvers in my life. Mr. Gibson had many enemies, senor. He always sleep with a loaded pistol beside his bed. She's a man of great violence. There have been times when all of us were afraid of him. Did you ever witness physical violence towards Mrs. Gibson? No, senor. I cannot say that I have. But I have heard him say many terrible things to her. He would taunt her in front of we servants. I have heard him do it many times. Thank you, Cesar. That will be all. Muito bem, senor. You know, Holmes, I still think the case against Miss Dunbar looks very black. I should agree with you if it were not for one fact. The finding of the revolver in her wardrobe. On the soul, Holmes, that seems to me the, the strongest evidence of all. I think not, old chap. Huh? We must look for consistency. Where there is a, a want of it, we must suspect deception. I don't quite follow you. Suppose for a moment that we visualize you in the character of a woman who in cold, premeditated fashion is about to murder a rival. You've planned it. A note has been written. The victim has come. You have a, a weapon. The crime is well done. It has been workmanlike and complete. You mean to tell me that after carrying out so crafty a crime, you'd be so stupid as to forget to fling the incriminating revolver to the bottom of the stream? Or perhaps in the uh, dense reeds that border it? Would you carefully carry it home and put it in the first place that would be searched? Your wardrobe? Well, perhaps in the excitement of no, the moment, one... No, my dear chap, I won't admit that's even possible. 
When a crime is coolly premeditated, then the means of covering it are coolly premeditated well, also. Well, then if Miss Dunbar didn't shoot Mrs. Gibson, who the devil did? I hope I can give you the answer to that question, Watson, when we've made one further visit. Oh, Lord. Where are we going now? To prison, old chap. Prison? Yes, we are going to Winchester Prison to call on Miss Dunbar. I'm certain that the key to this strange mystery lies in her hands. <laughs> Now, back to Dr. Watson and tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure, The Problem of Tor Bridge. Well, uh, Doctor, did you go to Winchester Prison and see Miss Dunbar? We did, Mr. Bartell. An hour later, I found the two of us sitting in a dank and gloomy cell, talking to one of the most beautiful girls that I've ever seen. Her bright, flashing eyes and her air of quiet confidence seemed sadly out of place in such a setting. Holmes spoke to her quietly... Dunbar, tell us of your true relations with the dead woman. She hated me, Mr. Holmes. She hated me with all the passion of her distorted mind. Please tell us exactly what happened on the evening of Mrs. Gibson's death. Well, I, I received a note from her in the morning. A note imploring me to meet her at the bridge after dinner that night. She said she had something important to say to me. Did you keep that note, Miss Dunbar? No, Doctor. She... Well, she asked me to destroy the note, so I burned it in the schoolroom grate. I saw no reason for such secrecy, but, well, I, I did as she asked. Mm, and yet she kept your reply very carefully. It's interesting. Tell me what happened when you met her that night. When I reached the bridge, she was waiting for me. I, I won't tell you what she said, but she poured out her whole wild fury and burning horrible words. I didn't answer. I couldn't. It was dreadful even to look at her. She was like an insane woman, standing there screaming disgusting insults at me. I, I put my hands to my ears and rushed away. Well, where was she standing when, when you left her? Within a few yards of the spot where her body was found later. And yet, presuming she met her death shortly after you left her, you heard no shot. No. No, I heard mm. nothing. But I was so upset, Mr. Holmes, that I rushed straight back to my room. Did you leave it again that night? Yes. When the alarm came that Mrs. Gibson was dead, I ran out with the others. Did you see uh, Mr. Gibson? Yes, Doctor. He had just returned from the bridge when I saw him. He had sent for the doctor and the police. Uh, this pistol that you found in your room, have you ever seen it before? Never, Mr. Holmes, I swear it. When was it found, Miss Dunbar? Next morning, when the police made their search. It was on the floor of my wardrobe where I keep my shoes. Mm, you had no idea how long it had been there? Well, it hadn't been there the morning before. How do you know? Because I had tidied up the wardrobe that day. I see. Then someone must have come into your room and placed the pistol there in order to incriminate you. I'm certain of it. Oh, when, uh, when could they have done that? Well, it, it, it could have been at mealtimes or when I was in the schoolroom with the children. Yes. Miss Dunbar, on exam examining the scene of Mrs. Gibson's death, I noticed that a piece of stonework on the underside of the parapet of the bridge had been broken away. Can you suggest any possible explanation for that? Oh, surely it must have been a mere coincidence, Mr. Holmes. Possibly. But why should it appear at the very time of the tragedy and at the very place? Could it possibly be the... Why, yes, of course. Idiot. Why didn't I think of it before? Come along, Watson. Where are we going, Holmes? Back to Thor Bridge, old fellow. As fast as we can get there. What have you found out, Mr. Holmes? The answer to this mystery, I hope, my dear young lady. You will get news before the day is out. And meanwhile, take my assurance that the clouds are lifting and that the light of truth is breaking through. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, you're soon back here. What have you found out? Turn on a few moments. Uh, you got my message? Oh, yes, sir. Here you are. Ball of twine. What you wanted for, I can't imagine. Uh, you'll soon see, Sergeant. Uh, Watson, I uh, have some recollection that you usually go armed on these excursions of ours. Yes, I'm carrying my revolver. Why? Uh, give it to me, old chap, will you? Oh. Thanks. Thank I, you? I believe your revolver may have a very intimate connection with the mystery we're investigating. <laughs> you're joking. Now, Watson, I'm very serious. What? I have a test to make. If the test is successful, Miss Dunbar will be free before nightfall, and the test will depend on the conduct of this revolver of yours. Yes, I'll take the precaution of unloading it. Uh-huh. There we are. Now, Sergeant, ball of twine, please. Wish I knew what you was up to, sir. 
I tie one into the twine like this to the handle of the revolver. So. Sergeant, see if you can find me a heavy stone, will you? Oh, right, your sir. Holmes, what are you doing? Trying to reconstruct the killing of Mrs. Gibson. But you've seen me miss the mark before, Watson. I have an instinct for such things, and yet it has sometimes played me false. It seemed a certainty when it first flashed across my mind in Miss Dunbar's cell. But one drawback of an active mind is that one can always conceive alternative explanations which would make our scent a false one. And yet, oh well, we can but try. Here's a nice stone, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Sergeant. Yes, now, sir. I tie the other end of the twine to the stone. Wait a minute. Like that. Splendid. Uh, Sergeant, will you please take the stone and stretch the twine across the parapet of the bridge there? so that the stone will swing just clear of the water on the other side of the bridge. Right, sir. I'll stand on the spot where Mrs. Gibson's body was found. That's it, Sergeant. Over the parapet. How's that, Mr. Rose? The stone swinging about eight feet above the water. Splendid. Now, Watson, watch closely. I raise the revolver to my head. Careful, Holmes, careful. Don't worry, old chap, it's not loaded. Now, let us imagine I am the late Mrs. Gibson. I raise the revolver to my head and fire it. Instantly, my fingers release their grip and... There's your answer, Watson. Great. Scott, the revolver flashed back out of your hand. Struck the parapet of the bridge, and then the weight of the stone flipped it over into the water. Was there ever a more exact demonstration? Come on, old fellow. You're a blooming magician, Mr. Holmes. That's what you are. A blooming magician. Look at that. Observe the second chip on the stonework of the parapet here. Same size as the first. And then the murder of Mrs. Gibson... It wasn't murder at all. It was suicide. What? We can follow the various steps quite clearly. A note was extracted very cleverly from Miss Dunbar, a note which made it appear that she had chosen the scene of the crime. Mrs. Gibson, in her anxiety that the note should be discovered, somewhat overdid it by holding it in her hand to the last. That alone should have excited my suspicions earlier than it did. So she stole one of her husband's revolvers and... planted and... the other one in Miss Dunbar's wardrobe. Exactly. After discharging one of the cartridges, which you could easily do in the woods without attracting suspicion... She then went down to the bridge, where she contrived this exceedingly ingenious method of getting rid of her weapon. When Miss Dunbar appeared, she used her last breath in pouring out her hatred, and then, when the girl had left, carried out her terrible purpose. Then the missing revolver... You'll find it uh, with the aid of a grappling hook at the bottom of the stream, and also the stone and the string, uh, with which this vindictive woman attempted to, to disguise her own crime and fasten a charge of... Murder on an innocent victim. Yes, Sergeant, and don't forget while you're at it that my revolver's down there, too. Oh, don't worry, Doctor. I'll get some grappling hooks right away. <laughs> I must say, Holmes, you've solved this case brilliantly. Quite brilliantly. Uh, I disagree, old chap. And I fear that you will not improve my reputation by adding the case of the Tor Bridge mystery to your annals. Oh, nonsense, but that's ridiculous. Oh, no, it isn't, old boy. I've been sluggish in my mind and wanting in that mixture of Imagination and reality, which is the very basis of my art. I confess that the chip in the stonework was a sufficient clue to suggest the true solution, and I blame myself for not having attained it sooner. Well, Holmes, personally, I agree with the sergeant's opinion of you. Oh? What was that, old fellow? You're a blooming magician, Mr. Holmes. That's what you are, a blooming magician. <laughs> Doctor, Holmes really was a magician. That is, if you did find Mrs. Gibson's revolver and your own in the oh, stream. Oh, we found them all right. You don't think I'd tell you the story otherwise, do you? Uh, what do you take me for, anyway? Well, now that you ask, I'll tell you. I take you for a very charming gentleman, a wonderful oh, storyteller, yeah. and a fine host. Oh, well, I do. I really, I... Well, you are a gentleman of the old school. Oh, and you general. do tell a fine story. <laughs> You flatter me, you... Uh... And you are a perfect host. Oh, I that meal we had tonight was wonderful. Oh, it was, eh? And, um, that, that wine, what kind was it? It was Petri wine, and you know it. <laughs> and I should have known that you were leading up to something. Mr. Bartill, you should be ashamed of yourself. You will do anything to get a chance to talk about Petri wine. Oh, I can't say that I blame you. Well, honestly, Doctor, I meant everything I said. But you don't really want me to stop talking about Petri wine, do you? After all, it's worth talking about, isn't it? And now, Dr. Watson, what new story are you planning to tell us next week? Well, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell an adventure that Holmes and I had amid the oriental magnificence of a Maharaja's palace in India. India? Sounds intriguing. Uh, what were you and Sherlock Holmes doing out there, Doctor? Well, we'll have to wait uh, till next week for the answer to that question, my boy.
But I can tell you that it was one of the weirdest problems that we ever had to solve. I call the story The Vanishing Elephant. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is adapted from the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Problem of Tor Bridge. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell about an exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And now let's see if our old friend, Dr. Watson's expected. He's out on the patio. Dr. Watson. Here I am, Mr. Watson. You sit out here this evening, my boy. Oh, swell idea, Doctor. It certainly is a beautiful night. It certainly is. Do I put chair and make yourself comfortable. That's it. Do you, uh, you care for some of my tobacco? <laughs> I think I'll stick to a cigarette, thanks. Well, Doctor, all ready for tonight's adventure? Yes, Mr. Bartell, I'm all ready. And a strange story it was. A very strange story. How did it begin? Stormy December night in 1900 with the rain pelting against the Baker Street windows? Or perhaps with you and the great Sherlock Holmes rattling along in a cab beside the foggy waterfront chasing some desperate criminal? <laughs> you make quite a good story to tell yourself, Mr. Bartell. No, no, no. The adventure I'm going to tell you took place many, many thousands of miles afield from our Baker Street headquarters. To be exact, in the Indian city of Parbutipur, about 200 miles north of Calcutta. It must have been a mighty important case that made you both travel that far. It certainly was, my boy, yes. It was announced in the, in the summer of uh, 1894, I remember, that Holmes received an urgent summons from the Maharaja of Parbutipur. After five weeks at sea, we reached Calcutta, a few days later, found ourselves on the veranda of our hotel in Parbutipur. As we sat there talking to the Maharaja's brother, Robert Singh, we could hear the faint throb of native drums and the haunting wail of an Indian lute coming from the bazaar. And so, gentlemen, I thought that before I took you over to my brother's palace, I would tell you something of the problems that beset him. An excellent idea, Mr. Singh. Uh, he is indeed, sir, particularly as you've just told us that your brother, the Maharaja, is not in the best of health. Uh, just so, Dr. Watson. Interviews tie him, and in any case, his command of the English language is not so extensive as mine. And now, sir, the problem, if you please. As to the exact problem, Mr. Holmes, I am not completely informed. My dear brother has not seen fit to confide his entire troubles, even to me. In fact, until your arrival yesterday, I did not even know that you had been sent for. But I can tell you that his worries are centered on the safety of the white elephant of Parbutipur. White elephant? Excuse me. Well, elephant? possibly you are not aware oh, that yes. white elephants actually do exist. Oh, yes, though I understand that they're extremely rare. Oh, extremely, Mr. Am I right in thinking that in the East a white elephant is considered sacred? Quite right. Pray continue, sir. Well, in 1750, the first white elephant was presented to my great-great-grandfather, and with it came a legend. The legend that the Maharaja's rule would be happy, healthy, and successful only as long as the elephant flourished. If the animal were to die, then the reign would come to an end and the Maharaja was doomed to a sudden death. Mr. Singh, who was responsible for the origin of this legend? Oh, a good and wise man who traveled from the mountains beyond Nepal. He it was who brought the first elephant 
to my great great grandfather. And how has the legend worked out in actual practice, sir? Its prophecies have come frighteningly true, Doctor Watson. Oh. The first elephant was killed by his mahout, his own keeper, after my illustrious ancestor had dismissed the man for incompetence. A week later, my great great grandfather was himself killed in a native uprising. And so it has gone on, gentlemen, since then. Amazing, amazing. When the elephants have died, and they have always died, the Maharaja of Vaputipur has died a violent death soon after. And as each new Maharaja has succeeded to the title, the wise man from the beyond the mountains has appeared, and with him, a new sacred white elephant. He last appeared four years ago when my brother inherited the title. Oh, but it can't still be the same man, oh, sir. Why not, Doctor? Well, <laughs> I mean to say... That'd make him a couple of hundred years old. Mm, a trifle less, I fancy, Doctor. <laughs> really, my dear sir. Seems to me your story's the wrong way round. Men don't live to such an age, whereas elephants are noted for their length of life. That's true, Watson, but apparently not the sacred white ones of Parbidi Poor. Uh, Mr. Singh, uh, in the event that uh, your brother's deaf, who would become the Maharaja? <laughs> <laughs> I should, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I can see what you are thinking, sir. The next in line to succeed to the title would have an excellent motive for wishing the animal dead. Well, the logic is inescapable. The thought had no personal implications, I assure you. Well, I'm very anxious to see this fabulous animal. The sacred white elephant is never seen except at the yearly festival that celebrates another anniversary of the Maharaja's rule. So the animal is only seen once a year, eh? Yes, Mr. Holmes. And when is the next anniversary, may I ask? In two weeks' time. Oh, our arrival seems to have coincided very nicely with the ceremony. Yes, Watson, a fact that I'm sure is not coincidental. Well, Mr. Singh, I'm very glad that you told us the legend of the sacred white elephant, and now I suggest that you take us to the palace. I'm most anxious to make the Maharaja's acquaintance. <laughs> This is the council chamber, gentlemen. If you will wait here a moment, I will go and see if my brother is well enough to receive you. Very well, sir. Oh, my soul, Holmes, I'm not easily impressed. This palace is absolutely staggering in its magnificence. Yes, it does rather take one's breath huh? away, doesn't it? It does. This floor is of the finest marble, and unless I'm much mistaken, that magnificent rug is a genuine Bacara. Yes, by Jove, it is. I could swear that the staircase we mounted a moment ago had railings of solid gold. You did, old chap. It did? This is a country of solid paradoxes. Oh, where opulence oh, beyond the dreams of Midas rubs shoulders with the direst poverty. And yet looking at a palace like this, it's not hard to see why India is called the brightest jewel in the diadem of the British Empire. Good Lord, what, what's that? That is an elephant trumpeting. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, do you suppose it's the sacred white one? Undoubtedly. You will recall the Maharaja's brother told us it's the only one at the palace. It is. It is an odd sound. Yeah, it's a very comforting one. The animal seems to be in the best of health. Who waits in the Maharaja's council room? Good gracious me. You, you gave me a start. I didn't hear you come in. And my friend and I are waiting for an audience with His Highness. No one can hold audience with the Maharaja. Please to leave. Now look here, my good fellow. Watson, please. please to leave. Uh, Watson. What? We've traveled 12,000 miles to see the Maharaja, sir, at his request. In any case, his brother is with him now, arranging an audience. I am Mada, the Maharaja's physician and chief counselor. And I tell you, you cannot hold audience today. And I tell you that I haven't the slightest intention of leaving the palace without seeing him. You defy authority of Mada? Saila! Now, I warn you that if I have any... Oh, I'm glad you're back, Mr. Singh. This fellow told us that we couldn't see your brother. And furthermore, he seems to labor under the misapprehension that he can have us thrown bodily out of the palace. Mother, you do not understand. These are the gentlemen my brother wishes to see. From England, he has sent for them. It was against my counsel they were summoned. No good will come of this. Follow me, gentlemen. My brother, the Maharaja, will see you now. But please do not stay with him too long. He is far from well. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson, I'm so happy you have arrived here safely. 
It was great imposition to ask you to travel so far. Oh, not at all, sir. I only hope we can prove of material assistance to you. Ranji. Yes, Robert? I wish you would permit Dr. Watson to examine you. I just was about to suggest myself, sir. In fact, I, I brought my medical bag along just in case. Mardo would not approve. Mada not believe in occidental medicine. I do not trust Mada. I do not think he wishes you to get well. Please, Ranji, let the doctor examine you. Very well. But you not tell not Mada. And now, um, what seems to be the, the trouble, Your Highness? Uh, my, my eyes, they torture me. Night and day, they torture me. Yes, I notice they seem very inflamed. Now, let me take a look at them. Oh, mm, oh. Yes, 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 yes. Now, uh, open oh. them a, a little wider, please, sir. Uh, I throb, burn, night and day. Night. They burn. Mm, the color is distinctly reddened. However, this isn't anything very, very serious, sir. What you're suffering from is a case of what we call conjunctivitis. What you do relieve pain, doctor? Oh, some eye drops will give you relief in no time, sir. I have some here in, in, in my bag. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Perhaps medicine will help. Yes, yes, I'm sure it will, sir. Here you are, now. this small bottle and an eyedropper. Uh, this is, is an eyedropper. Uh, just put a few drops in the corner of each eye, and I'm sure that you'll, you'll get some relief in no time at all. Thank you, Dr. Watson. You think there is nothing seriously wrong, Doctor? Mother gave it as his opinion that my brother's eyesight was in serious danger. Well, pardon my saying so, I think it more likely that my medical knowledge e exceeds his. I can assure you there's nothing serious to the matter with your brother's eyes, sir. I'm happy you say so. <clears throat> now you will please excuse me while I take medication and rest a little. We discuss my problems later. Quarters already prepared for you in palace. You do not mind, Mr. Holmes? Not at all, sir. Though in the interim, I should like to employ my time to the full by inspecting your sacred white elephant. No. No, that I cannot allow. I must talk to you first. I think, sir, you will do well to give me permission to see the animal. I already have my suspicions as to your reason for bringing me here, and it will be best if I'm completely informed when we have our discussion. Very well. Can do no harm. Here. Take ring. Show ring to Sucro. He's keeper of animal... Sucro will let you into Elephant House when he sees Ring. Thank you, sir. And please rest comfortably. I'm sure that your worries are nearly at an end. Come on, Watson. this was the elephant house. Why in thunder doesn't the keeper open the door? I imagine because his mind is preoccupied with music. Knock again, old fellow, will you? Uh-huh. He heard us that time. Yeah, about time. He must have been knocking here for five or six minutes. Alarm, sir. He am mother. Hada hati tekni koasti. Tum tekni ne sekta. Sekta. Maharaja side. Kum koasti matik dio. Mm-hmm. Both out yourself. Eat her out. Say, Holmes, the Maharaja's ring certainly seemed to do the trick. He didn't want to let us in until you showed it to him, oh, did he? Good and faithful <laughs> servant, our friend Sukro. Kier, to die. Kier. Ati, Magir. Magir. Kasamapit. Mejot Aisab. What's happened, Holmes? The white elephant has disappeared, Watson. Disappeared? That's ridiculous. Elephants don't just disappear. Kier, Karigasab. Maharaja Sad Kibolo. Kali Umkobolo. Potacha, sir. Potacha. Where's he going? I told him to go to the Maharaja and give him the news. But he was to tell it to no one else. But Holmes, this is ridiculous. We heard the animal trumpeting here less than half an hour ago. How can an elephant be spirited away in that amount of time? That's what we have to find out, my dear fellow. I've often heard of the Indian rope trick. Now we have a first-hand opportunity of solving a new mystery. The problem of the disappearing elephant. <laughs> Oh, 
Holmes, this is farcical. We spent half an hour searching this elephant house. After all, an elephant isn't exactly insignificant. I doubt if you're going to find it under those boards in the corner over there. True, Watson, but nonetheless, there are interesting clues to be observed. Clues? What <laughs> clues? Come over here, old chap. Bloodstains? Wait, Scott, you're not suggesting that's elephant's blood? It's hard to say, though I would venture the opinion that it would require the blood of several human corpses to produce an equivalent amount of blood. In any case, you will notice that the stains are dried and old. Hello, that must be the elephant keeper back from the palace. Dr. Watson, it's Mother, the Maharaja's physician. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, at once you must come back to the palace. What's wrong, sir? It is the Maharaja. Death has come to him. Dead? Great heavens. Exactly what happened? Sukro, keeper of the elephant, came to the Maharaja. He said he had the most important message to deliver. He had. I told him to deliver it. Then what happened? A few moments later, I heard cries. I went to the Maharaja's room and found him in delirium. He was saying about the elephant having disappeared. His brother and I tried to give comfort to him, but we could do nothing. His breathing became more and more labored. Finally... It stopped altogether. So the doom of Parvati Poor is fulfilled once again. The elephant is gone and the Maharaja's reign is ended. Come on. We must go to the palace. Yes, I must examine the body at once. You're certain it was a natural death, Mr. Mutter? Positive, Mr. No Holmes. symptoms of poisoning, for example? Mr. Holmes, I have read some of your sensational stories in which obscure deaths are attributed to a, to a subtle oriental poison unknown to Western science. I can assure you that if the Maharaja has been poisoned, it has been caused by no poison known to me. When did he last eat? Over uh, eight hours ago. Well, possibly he died of shock, Holmes. Shock and hysteria. When he knew that the elephant had vanished. Yes, it's possible, but it's murder just the same. Murder? Why do you say that, Mr. Holmes? Because whoever caused the elephant to disappear did it with the deliberate intention of ending the Maharaja's reign. A diabolical plot, and one that I intend to overcome before this day is out. <laughs> Now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure, the case of the vanishing elephant. Tell me, Doctor, did you examine the Maharaja's body? Yes, of course I did, Mr. Bartell. Holmes was convinced that the Maharaja had been murdered, but I could find no trace of foul play. After my examination, I joined Holmes in our quarters, and I gave him my opinion. Found that ending? Mm, looks like natural death to me, Holmes. No traces of poison? None that I could see. Of course, it's hard to be certain without an autopsy. Did you suggest one? Yes, but the new Maharaja won't hear of it. It's against their religion, apparently. Yes, I was afraid of that. Meantime, I've been conducting a cross-examination of some of the palace servants. Oh? What do you find out? Principally that all of them heard the elephant trumpeting this morning. Did any of them suggest how the animal might have been smuggled out to the palace ground? They insisted that such a feat would be impossible without their knowledge. Well, what's our next move, Holmes? To interrogate the one person who I'm sure can give us the true story of the elephant's disappearance, its keeper. Remember, we haven't seen him since he took the message to the palace. I suggest we return to the elephant house and have a, a persuasive talk with him. Mm, this must be the house, the only one that's near the elephant pen. Ramshackle-looking place, isn't it? Extremely. Sucro! Sucro! Well, don't tell me that he's vanished, too. <laughs> this is beginning to get on my nerves. I don't know how this... oh, no. Sucro! I think under the circumstances, we'll take the liberty of entering. Sucro! Look, Holmes. Look on the floor. <sighs> We're too late. Good Lord. What a horrible sight. His throat's been cut. Obviously another murder. He knew the secret of the vanishing elephant. Let's have a look around. Uh -huh. Sucro was quite a, quite a musician. Look at this weird assortment of instruments. Native lute. Well, we heard him playing that today as we approached the elephant house. What's this? Looks like a sort of giant megaphone. It's a musical instrument of some kind. Observe the mouthpiece here. Let's see what kind of noise it makes. Great. Scott, the instrument sounds exactly like 
Like an elephant crumpeting. Of course. Now, Miss Carol, why didn't I think of this before? Come on, Watson, back to the palace as fast as your legs can carry you. The mystery is solved. <laughs> say you have solved the problem of the missing elephant, Mr. Yes, sir. Holmes. And also the cause of your brother's death and Sucro's murder. Indeed. That is very important news. Uh, won't you both sit down, please? Uh, thank you, sir. I can't. Uh, please proceed, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Uh, first, the elephant did not vanish today. The beast must have died a natural death months ago. All that happened today was that I discovered its absence. Are you suggesting that my brother knew the beast was dead? I am, sir. But he was afraid to publish the news. He knew that his rule would fall into a state of chaos if the fact were known. You yourself, sir, have told us how strong is the native belief in this legend. So how did he dispose of the elephant? Unobtrusively over a period of time. The bloodstains in the elephant house would indicate that the animal had been cut up into disposable fragments, which could be removed by the faithful sucro without attracting suspicion. All this time, though, the elephant horn was blown at suitable intervals to indicate that the sacred animal was still alive. But if the Maharaja knew the beast was dead, why did he die of shock when he received the news? I think the answer to that question, Dr. Watson, would be that my brother died of shame when he knew that his imposture had been discovered. Oh, oh, oh. A little far-fetched, sir, if you don't mind my saying so. No, I'm certain the reason your brother brought me to your country was to reveal that imposture to me. He knew the day was coming soon when he must show the elephant to his people. The festival would have been held in two weeks' time, I think you told us, sir. I imagine that he wanted me to devise a method of smuggling a new white elephant into the palace grounds before that time. Tell me, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, why did my brother die today? Because he was murdered. Just as Sucro was murdered later. Murdered? How, Holmes? Oh, very ingeniously. Uh, by poison, but not, as you might expect, by any... Subtle eastern poison. No, one of the uh, most recent of western poisons was used. A poison unknown to oriental science. Delirium followed by a strangulated breathing is highly typical of the newly discovered poison, hyoscyamine. But he hadn't eaten for eight hours. True, Watson, but you see this um, hyoscyamine was administered to uh, an eyedropper. Good heavens, an eyedropper. The... Poison penetrates with unusual ease through the membranes of the eyes, if you will recall. Yes, you're right, but Joe, it does. It must have been that physician fellow, Mar Mardo, whatever his name is. No, my dear chap. Uh, this has been a case of confusions. Let's do a little clear thinking now, shall we? You see, uh, we were deceived by the apparent sequence of events. We discovered the elephant missing and thought that fact had caused the Maharaja's death. Well, as his murder was quite a separate matter, the poison must have been placed in the eye drops. While we were in the elephant house. Precisely, dear chap. And uh, when the murderer saw how the uh, problem of the missing elephant confused us, he killed its unfortunate keeper to prevent us from learning the truth. Yes, you're strangely silent, Mr. Singh. Am I, Mr. Holmes? I am fascinated by your flow of unassailable logic. Of course, sir. Uh, you realize that I am now the Maharaja, the King of Kings, an absolute ruler with all power, including that of the police. Do you, uh, do you care to denounce the murderer to me? Oh, come, come, sir. I think it's time the buttons came off our foils. I'm well aware that you studied medicine at the University of Edinburgh. You have the motive, the opportunity, and the knowledge to kill your brother. The murder of Sucro was probably performed by an underling. Great Scott, what a shocking You are disgrace. a clever man, Mr. Holmes. A very clever man. Clever enough to realize that an absolute ruler, a ruler with all powers, including that of the police, is not apt to denounce himself. Again, your logic is unassailable. Goodbye, gentlemen. I trust your voyage home will be a pleasant one. I warn you, sir, that I shall make a full report of my findings of this case to the British Commissioner for this state. Why should he prove more effectual than the great Sherlock Holmes? Goodbye, gentlemen, and a bon voyage. Filthy murderer. Makes my blood boil to think that he can't be brought to justice. But he can, and he will be. If the civilized laws of the Occident cannot be enforced here, then we must fight him with his own weapons. What do you mean, Holmes? If we have a farewell talk with Mr. Madder, the dead Maharaja's physician, friend, and counselor. <laughs> The 
this is a terrible story you have told me, Mr. Holmes. My beloved ruler murdered by his own brother, and yet he cannot be made to account for his crimes. He can be, sir, if you will help Mr. Holmes. Of course I will. What can I do? Try and obtain the eye drops before they're destroyed, will you? Have them analyzed by a Western scientist and forward the reports to me in London. I'll take the necessary action. I will try to do that, Mr. Holmes. But if I fail, there is one other way I can avenge my master's death. In a few weeks, the new Maharaja will be enthroned. Ah. I understand you, sir. The wise man from beyond the mountains of Nepal will bring a new white elephant. Perhaps an elephant that will not live very long. You understand me perfectly, Mr. Holmes. I can promise you that the elephant will die in a very short time. And with it, the new Maharaja, my master, shall be avenged. <laughs> Quite a story, Doctor. Quite a story. And tell me, what did happen to the next white elephant of uh, well, Harvard Port? by an extraordinary coincidence, it died the day after the new Maharaja's enthronement. And that scoundrel was himself killed in an uprising that occurred just a few days later. You know something? I think I could be very happy as an Indian Maharaja. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Beautiful palace, yeah. beautiful women, beautiful <laughs> jewels. <laughs> And every year on my birthday, the natives would give me my weight in gold. Uh, you know, I could learn to like that. That is, if I tried. Yes, and every week you'd speak to your subjects over the radio and tell them all about Petri wine. Oh, now, now, wait a minute, Doctor. I don't always talk about Petri wine. <laughs> That's right. You, you don't always talk about Petri wine. You, you've got to sleep sometime. <laughs> all right, go on. Kid me about it. Well, Doctor, how's about giving us a clue to next week's story? Now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you an adventure in which uh, I'm afraid I... <laughs> well, I didn't exactly cover myself with glory, shall we say. But I think you'll find the story an exciting one, my boy, because it's composed of equal parts of romance, of international intrigue, and of sudden death. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Engineer's Thumb. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine... Invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And now let's visit with our good friend, Dr. Watson. I know he's expecting us. Come in, come in, come in. Oh, good evening, Mr. Bartell. Evening, Doctor. Oh, you have the old black tin dispatch box out again, I Yes, see. my boy. I've just been refreshing my memory on one or two points in connection with tonight's story. Uh, draw up a chair. Thanks. That's it, that's it. The tobacco's in the jar beside you. Thanks, Doctor. Uh, you know, I'm particularly excited about hearing your story tonight. Uh, last week, you told us that Sherlock Holmes' brother, Mycroft Holmes, took part in the adventure. That's quite right, Mr. Bartell. <laughs> I didn't even know Mr. Holmes had a brother. 
I wish you'd tell me something about him. Well, Mycroft was seven years older than Sherlock, but the difference between them was amazing. While Holmes was lean and consumed with a burning energy, his elder brother was fat and lazy. And yet Holmes has often told me that Mycroft was his superior in powers of observation and deduction. Well, now that you've thoroughly whetted my appetite, Doctor, how's about it? Very well, my boy. I suppose this story really began in Mycroft Holmes' room at the Foreign Office in London. Although I've said he was a lazy man, he did hold a position of considerable importance. In fact, you may remember that on more than one occasion, Holmes has said, Mycroft is the British government. But uh, to get back to my story. It's on a June morning in 1912, just before the First World War, that a young man in the foreign office named Guy Travers stood talking to Mycroft Holmes, who sat sprawled in an armchair before him, his feet resting on another chair, his cupped hands cradling his ample stump. Holmes. I say, Mr. Holmes, you haven't gone to sleep, have you, sir? No, Travers, I'm not asleep. I'm just waiting for you to get to the point. Well, sir, the point is that I'm on the track of a most elusive female spy. Dear me, how exhausting. She's dangerous, sir, very dangerous. She's not only a collector of information, but a sort of central clearinghouse of military secrets as well. You seem to be a little young, Travers, to be on such a case. I asked for the assignment, sir. Why? Female spies aren't as glamorous as they sound, you know. No one knows that better than I do, sir. You see, my brother got mixed up with this girl two years ago. He was cashiered from his regiment and committed suicide. I'm sorry, Travers. Tell me what you found out about her. You say you've been on her track? I've traced her to a number of seaside towns, but she keeps slipping through my fingers. Have you a list of the towns? Yes, sir. Here you are. No, no, no. You read them to me. Well, I first got on her track at Torquay... From there, I trailed her to Weymouth, Bournemouth, Portsmouth, Bognor, Worthing, Hove, Brighton, and... Uh... I trust you drew the obvious conclusion. I think I did, sir. Several of those towns are naval bases. No, no, no. The list you've just read me is a recognized theatrical circuit. Oh, uh, I never thought of that. The simplest way to track down your spy is to find whether she was appearing in either a play or variety act in all of the towns on the dates covered by your inquiries. Yes, Mr. Holmes, I'll do that at once, and then I'll report back to you. Oh, very well, if you must. Close the door quietly, won't you? I'm confoundedly sleepy. Mr. Holmes? Mr. Holmes, you haven't gone to sleep again, have you, sir? Oh, it's you, Travers. Well, <coughs> what did you find out? A great deal, sir. The only theatrical show that was appearing at all of those towns was a magician's act called The Great Gandolfo. I trust you went and saw the performance. Yes, sir. Last night at Hastings. And? The magician's assistant was a girl who looked exactly like the one I saw my brother with two years ago. Did you go backstage and talk to her? Yes, sir. But it's a funny thing. For though she looked exactly like the other girl, I swear she isn't the same one. This girl seemed utterly charming and sincere when she told me she'd never heard of my brother. Hmm, that's the danger of putting you young fellows on a case of this kind. A beautiful woman and a good actress can fool you nine times out of ten. What's your next move, Travers? Well, sir, I was hoping perhaps... Perhaps you might come down with me and see the act. It's playing at Eastbourne tomorrow. It's not very far, sir. Stir my 20 stone. <laughs> leave, leave the comforts of my office and club to track a spy. No, my boy. However, your mention of Eastbourne gives me an idea. Yes, sir? My young brother, Sherlock, is living on a bee farm a few miles outside Eastbourne. He might help you. He's a great detective, isn't he, sir? I have never regarded him as one... Though I will admit that for a man with such a shocking excess of physical energy, he possesses a relatively superior mind. Yes, yes, go and ask Sherlock. Thank you, sir, I will. <laughs> Tell him that if, uh, if he can't solve the case, I'll do it for him, and without leaving London. And so, Mr. Holmes, I did as your brother suggested and came down here to Eastbourne to tell you about the case. I quite understand, Mr. Travers. Pretty interesting story it is, too, my boy. I'm certainly glad that I happen to be staying down here with you, Holmes. Uh, you'll handle the case, of course. I'm undecided, old fellow. The problem presents some interesting possibilities, and yet my life here among the bees has taken on a pleasant and soothing pattern. Oh, I, I hate to disturb oh, it. Oh, come, 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 Holmes. It'll be good for you to get away from your wretched bees for a few days. I forgot to tell you, Mr. Holmes. As I left your brother, he told me that if you couldn't solve the case, he'd do it for you. 
without leaving London. <laughs> Dear old Mycroft, he meant that as a challenge. Hand me the paper, will you, Watson? Uh, yeah. Thanks, old chap. Oh, what are you looking for? The amusement guide. Ah, here it is. Devonshire Theatre, Eastbourne, twice, nightly varieties, 6, 30, and 9, the great Gandolfo, king of magic. You mean you'll come to the theatre with me tonight, Mr. Holmes? Certainly. I can't allow Mycroft's challenge to go unanswered, and I'm sure that Dr. Watson will accompany us when I tell him Miss Sissy Gitana is also appearing on the bill singing, an old favourite of his. There was I waiting at the church, waiting at the church, waiting at the church. Lord, how it did upset me. All at once, he sent me round a note. Here's the very note. This is what he wrote. Can't get away to marry you today. My wife won't let me. <laughs> That's a most entertaining woman, Sissy Katana. <laughs> And Dash good looking too. My wife will let me. <laughs> the great Gandolfo is next, Mr. Holmes. Yes, I was just studying the program. Ha ha ha. He's not exactly modest in his claims, is he? The great Gandolfo, the world staggering illusionist. Presenting the ceiling cabinet mystery assisted by Miss Florine Lasseur. Oh, dear me, how very florid. I must say, I love this old music hall flavor. I remember going to the Palace Theatre a few years ago to see a perfectly charming girl who wore a white dress that made her look like a little white rabbit. <laughs> that dress did look frightfully becoming, I must say. I sent my card round the stage door with some flowers, of course, but to my amazement... That's a fascinating yet... story, old fellow, what? but I'm afraid you'll have to finish it later. The curtain's going up. There he is. That's the great Gandolfo. By Jones, his assistant's very attractive, isn't she? Listen. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to be here before you tonight. I may say that the ceiling cabinet mystery that I am about to present has entertained and perplexed half a dozen of the crown kings of Europe uh, together with their queens. Come, don't talk so much. Get on with the trick. <laughs> <laughs> and I may say I'm hoping that you, ladies and gentlemen, will give me the same courtesy and attention that was given me by the royalty I have just mentioned. Now, before I present my illusion, I should like to ask for two volunteers from the audience who will come up here beside me on the stage so that I may be watched. Uh, two, uh, two volunteers, please. Uh, wait for us here, Mr. Travers. Very well, Mr. Holmes. Come on, Watson. You mean that we're going up on the stage? Yes, it's a wonderful opportunity. Do I see two gentlemen rising? Splendid. Two gentlemen are coming up from the audience. Two gentlemen that I have never seen before. Watch the step, please. That's it. Over the footlights and on to the stage. That's right. And now, sir, have you uh, ever seen me before? Never. And uh, you, sir? Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to speak up, sir. No, I haven't. Miss <laughs> uh, LeSueur, please see that the gentlemen are seated. I thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to watch me closely. You will observe that there is a wooden cabinet on the stage. There is also another cabinet of the same shape and size hanging high above me, which uh, you can all, all see. Um, a glass of water, please, Miss LeSueur. Oh, go on, put a sock in it. <laughs> what did you say, sir? You heard you ain't got cloth here. <laughs> we will dispense with the glass of water. Now, my assistant, Miss Florine LeSueur, will step into this cabinet on the stage. I want you two gentlemen to watch very closely. Miss LeSueur is now lying inside the cabinet. Is she not? Yes, she is. Oh, very well. I close the lid. So, I uh, lock it with these bolts. And now, I ask one of you gentlemen to attach this uh, padlock to the box. Uh, you, sir, will you oblige me? Very well. I thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, before your eyes you have seen Miss LeSueur enter a cabinet on this stage. A cabinet that has been bolted and padlocked. You can still see the duplicate cabinet hanging above me by an attachment of wires and pulleys. I now count a one, a two, 
a three, and fire this revolver at the cabinet above me. Now, if you two gentlemen will kindly help me, we will lower the ceiling cabinet to the stage. You will notice that this cabinet is also bolted and padlocked. I will ask one of you two gentlemen to unbolt it. I thank you, sir. And to this gentleman, I shall hand the key of the padlock. Uh, kindly unlock it, sir. I thank you. And now, if you will both raise the lid of the cabinet. And here, ladies and gentlemen, is Miss Florine Lasseur. <laughs> Why did we have to leave, Holmes? I was, I was having a wonderful time. Sorry to drag you away, Watson, but there's work to be done. Mr. Holmes, if you want to go backstage, I'll introduce you to Miss Lasseur. Oh, that's a splendid idea. But before we do that, Mr. Travers, there's one important fact I want to know. What is it, sir? I presume you have a dossier of the available facts concerning this spy? Yes, sir, everything that we've been able to find out. Uh, among that evidence, do you by any chance have any fingerprint records? Yes, sir, I do. Splendid. Then let's go at once to the nearest police station and compare the fingerprints on this glass with those in your possession. Where did you get that glass, Holmes? You remember that Miss Lasseur, before she entered that cabinet on the stage, handed Gandolfo a glass of water. You mean that's the glass? Why else should I be carrying a drinking glass with me, old chap? Hmm, very neat, Mr. Holmes, and right under the nose of a magician, too. Well, I'm not exactly inept at the practice of... Uh, Leisure domain myself, Mr. Travers. Come on, let's have a talk with that local fingerprint expert, shall we? Mr. Holmes, the fingerprints on this glass you brought me are not the same as the one shown in this record. You're positive? Oh, absolutely, sir. Just as I thought. I'm much obliged to you. Always glad to help a gentleman like you, Mr. Holmes. Thank you and good night. Come on, Travers. Watson? I wish you'd explain what you're up to, Holmes. So do I, sir. I'm completely in the dark. Surely it's obvious. The only way Gandalfo's trick could be done is by using twin girls, dressed identically, of course. One in the cabinet on the stage and the other in the cabinet hanging from the ceiling. I don't know whether you noticed it, Watson, but there were some small holes drilled around the base of the box, undoubtedly, to enable its occupant to breathe. By George, of course. That would explain why the girl I spoke to didn't seem to know me, or my brother when I spoke of him. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And in any case, how better could a spy hide herself from a role where her employer, a magician, must, by the very nature of his trick, deny her existence? The question is, which girl is the spy? This fingerprint test has given us the answer. You mean it isn't the girl on the stage, the one who assisted Gandolfo? It certainly is not, old fellow. Your spy will be in the cabinet, suspended high above the stage of the Devonshire Theatre at nine o'clock this evening. But this time, we will watch the performance from the audience. Now, watch me closely, ladies and gentlemen. There is no deception. A one, a two, a three... <laughs> And now, if you two gentlemen will kindly help me, we will untie the ropes and lower the ceiling cabinet to the stage. Holmes, we, we mustn't let her get away. Don't worry, old chap. But keep your eyes skinned. You may have a surprise for us. And I will now ask one of you two gentlemen to unbolt the cabinet. I thank you, sir. And now... If this gentleman will take the key and unlock the padlock, I thank you, sir. And now, if you will both raise the lid of the cabinet, I thank you. And here, ladies and gentlemen, is Miss Florine Lasseur. Miss Lasseur, step out, please. Miss Lasseur, bring down the curtain. It's been an accident. Come on, Watson. Let's get up on the stage. Right, your Holmes. What happened, sir? It's Miss Lasseur. She's been injured. I'm a doctor. Let me look at her. I'm afraid she's beyond the help of doctors, Watson. Look at that bullet wound in her head. She's been murdered. And 
And now back to Dr. Watson and tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure, The Great Gandolfo. What happened next, Doctor? You just got to the part where you and Sherlock Holmes on, on the stage of a vaudeville theater were examining the dead body of one of the great Gandolfo's assistants. That's right, my boy. As you can imagine, the excitement was intense. The local police were soon at the theater, and the officer in charge, a certain Sergeant Buff, seemed <clears throat> to take a very great personal dislike to Sherlock Holmes. The great Sherlock Holmes comes out of retirement to teach our police force how to handle a case, does oh, he? Oh, Sergeant Buff, you're being ridiculous. I'm not trying to teach the police anything. You follow your own line of investigation and I'll follow mine. And supposing I say I don't want private detectives poking their nose into a police investigation. <laughs> then, my good man, I shall report your conduct to the local chief of police and obtain the necessary permission. Uh, no need to get uppity about it, Mr. Holmes, but too many cooks spoil the broth, you know. Oh, an extremely profound remark, Sergeant. And now, if you'll excuse me, I've work to do. And so have I. And we'll see who gets to the bottom of this first. I'm going to Condolfo's dressing room. Holmes, I'm worried about the dead girl's twin sister. I've been looking for her everywhere, and no one seems to have seen her since the tragedy occurred. Naturally, my dear chap, you would hardly expect her to reveal the secret of the cabinet trick by exposing the fact that the uh, dead girl had a twin. But I never thought of that. But we saw her there on the stage when the trick started. Seems to me that she's in great danger. She is in very great danger. But don't worry. I've taken the precaution of having her guarded. Oh, how, Holmes? I'll explain that to you later. In the meantime, we have to work fast. It appears that Sergeant Buff is out to try and show me up by uh, solving the case first. That makes the second challenge I've received today. Well, Mr. Holmes, and how are you getting along? Splendidly, thanks. And you? I'm beaten, I don't mind admitting it. I thought at first the one man it couldn't be was Gandolfo because he was on the stage all the time. But then it seemed to me that he might have fired a live bullet when he shot at the box on the ceiling. But the angle from the stage wouldn't coincide with the bullet hole in the bottom of the box, Sergeant. That shot must have been fired from the audience below. Uh, Mr. Holmes, uh, you know who did it, don't you? Yes, Sergeant, I do. Well, I, I wish you'd tell me, Mr. Holmes. It should be obvious, Sergeant. Watson, you examined the corpse. Please tell the sergeant your findings. The girl was lying on her back in the box. There was a small hole in her forehead and a large one in the nape of her neck. Exactly. And since the point of entrance of a bullet is smaller than the point of exit, it proves that she must have been shot lying in the box from above. Once the box was in position over the audience, uh, she could have been shot only from below. Therefore, the girl had already been killed when the box was hoisted to the ceiling. By Joe, yes. And only one person could have done that. Only two. Uh, how do you figure that out, Mr. Holmes? The dead girl's sister had the same opportunity as the great Gandolfo himself. Of course she had. Uh, now I see why you were having her watched, Mr. Holmes. If you'll excuse me saying so, sir, I'm beginning to think it's a good thing you're on this case after all. <laughs> oh, that's very generous of you, Sergeant. And now perhaps if you... Uh... You'll do me the favor of keeping an eye on Mr. Gandolfo yourself? Uh, of course I will, sir. Where are we going, Holmes? To the Jolly Fisherman Hotel to call on Miss Lasseur. How do you know she's there? I just received a message from young Travers. He followed her on my instructions as she left the theater. Come on, old chap. There's no time to be lost. <laughs> Ah, there you are, Travers. Miss Lasseur is still here, I trust. Yes, Mr. Holmes. She's up in her room. I wonder if you'd mind asking her to come down and see me. I'm sure that we can talk privately in the lounge over there. Right you are, Mr. Holmes. I'll go and get her. What are you going to say to Miss Lasseur, Holmes? That depends on her attitude, old chap. Come on. Let's go into the lounge, shall we? Oh, it's a lucky thing that you had her followed. It was an obvious precaution, Watson. You see, I realized from the very nature of the cabinet trick that Miss Lasseur would have to leave the theater after escaping through the trap door below the cabinet uh, that was on the stage, before her twin sister descended from the cabinet that was su suspended from the ceiling. And she doesn't know that her sister's been murdered, huh? If she is innocent, she doesn't. And if she is innocent, then we'll know that our murderer is Gandolfo. Shh, shh. Here she comes. I've told Miss Lesseur that you want to talk to her privately, Mr. Holmes. If it's the act you want to talk about, Mr. Holmes, I've nothing to say. Magicians have a code of honor, you know. I quite appreciate that fact, Miss Lasseur. Won't you sit down? What do you want with me? I have news for you. News of your twin sister. My... I haven't got a twin sister. My friend knows exactly how the cabinet trick is done, my dear young lady. Yes, you might as well tell the truth, Miss Lasseur. 
Well, all right then, so I have a twin sister. What of it? No crime in that, is there? What are you getting at? I want you to believe that I'm here to help you, my dear. You're going to need help and courage. What are you getting at? Oh, come on, tell me. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Miss Lasseur, your sister is dead. Dead? Oh, I don't believe it. I'm afraid it's true. She was murdered. You're lying. This is a trick. You're trying to make me give myself away. I'm trying to get at the truth. Your sister was found shot through the head when the cabinet was lowered to the stage tonight. I, I still don't believe it. Why should my friend lie to you? How was your sister the last time you saw her for the commencement of the act? No different from any other time. Who was responsible for superintending her entry into the cabinet? Gandalfo, or me. She used to go into it before the performance, when the stage was dark and deserted. Did you help her enter the box tonight? No. Gandolfo did. You knew, of course, of your sister's activities. How do you mean? That she was engaged in espionage. That's not true. Very well, Miss Lassoua. If you won't be honest with me, I'm afraid I'll have to turn you over to the police. I think you'll find their methods are a little more crude than mine, though. The, the police? Oh, no. No, don't do that, Mr. Holmes. All right, I'll tell you everything. Gandolfo's got me so frightened of him. I was lying to you. I knew that my sister was working for him. I tried to stop her, but she loved money. And Gandolfo gave her plenty of that. They had a row before the show tonight. She knew you were on the stage at the first performance, Mr. Holmes. Gandolfo had spotted you too, because she was frightened. Said she knew you'd catch her and she wanted to run away. Gandolfo told her that she had to appear tonight. And they were still arguing about it when they left the dressing room. The dirty swine killed her because he was afraid she'd give him away. And now he'll kill me too! Don't worry, my dear. The great Gandolfo will be beyond the help of magic before this night is out. Yes, he'll be behind bars where he belongs. Travers. Yes, sir. And stay here with Miss Lasseur, will you? We'll be back later. At the moment, there is unfinished business awaiting us at the Devonshire Theatre. <laughs> Mr. Rums, I can't tell you how grateful I am. Gandolfo's safely in prison, thanks to you, and now you tells me you don't want no credit in the case. Oh, my dear sergeant. I'm really a bee farmer, you know. In any case, I want to restore your faith in private detectives. The next time you meet one, I'm, I, I'm sure you won't be so, um, uh, so unfriendly, shall I say? Uh, I, I'm humble, sir. I, I'm very humble, and, and I thank you very kindly for all you've done. Oh, and uh, uh, by the way, Mr. Holmes, uh, this telegram arrived for you at the theater uh, while you were away, and here you are, sir. Oh, thank you, Sergeant Buck. Uh, no, sir, it's me that should be thanking you, sir. Who on earth knew that you were at the theater tonight? I will soon find out. Well, what does it say, Holmes? <laughs> it's from my brother, Mycroft. Mycroft? What's he got to say? Oh, really, it's quite humiliating. After all, he said he hadn't... Uh, he wouldn't have to, and he ne never did leave his armchair in London. Listen to this. Have just checked on Gandolfo's repertoire of magic tricks. You will find spy in box suspended from ceiling of theatre. Elementary, eh, my dear Sherlock? Why, <laughs> Joe Holmes, he, he really is amazing, isn't he? <laughs> he is also a prophet, old chap. Prophet? How do you mean? Well, he indicates the handwriting on the wall. I'm past my prime. I'm too old for alert detection. It's back to me bee farm, old fellow. It's back to me bees. Well, Doctor, that was a swell story. I bet it was an interesting case to work on. Yes, it certainly was. I've always had a fancy for the theater, you know. <laughs> what you really mean, Doctor, is you always had an eye for a pretty girl. <laughs> Mr. Bartell, you a blunt fellow. <laughs> Why blunt. not? I must admit, I like to look at a pretty girl myself. You, Mr. Bartell? Why shouldn't I like to look at a pretty girl? Oh, go right ahead and look, my dear fellow. Go right ahead. You, you just sort of surprised me a bit, that's all. I never thought you gave a moment's consideration to anything but pet rewine. <laughs> now you're really pulling my leg. <laughs> I must admit, I do talk a lot about pet rewine, but after all, Doctor, it's worth talking about. Well, Doctor, how's about giving us a clue to next week's Sherlock Holmes adventure? Well, now, uh, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a most unusual story that took place aboard a small steamship as it plowed through the stormy seas of the Indian Ocean. 
I call the adventure Murder by Moonlight. Oh, uh, before I say good night, ladies and gentlemen, remember that on Saturday, October the 27th, the nation will observe Navy Day. This is your opportunity to thank your fleet for its magnificent contribution towards victory. Don't forget, will you? Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Second Stain. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.